Welcome, welcome everybody to the second edition of the autumn meeting for young chemists in the biomedical sciences. Uh, this meeting has, be, has been conceived for under 40 people, including undergraduate students, PhD students, postdocs, assistant professor, who are carrying out uh, their research within the frame of uh, biomedical sciences, focusing on different perspectives, including the analytical chemistry, the medicinal chemistry, and the pharmaceutical technologies and drug delivery. Uh, with respect to previous edition, uh, that, that, that we had last year, we had the opportunity uh, this year to improve the sessions and to include novel contents. Thanks to all your contribution, thanks to all your interest, we had 200 registration and uh, 90 contribution, including plenary lectures, invited speaker, oral, sliding talk, and poster. We have three sessions starting today with analytical chemistry, Tomorrow, we are going to continue with medicinal chemistry. And the day after tomorrow, we will have the, a session dedicated to pharmaceutical technologies and drug delivery. All this work had been made by the organizing committee that I would like to thank, that is composed by young assistant professor from the Department of Pharmacy at the University of Naples, Federico II. But of course, we had to thank all the sponsors that uh, supported us and uh, give help in promoting the event, like uh, the Italian Chemistry, so the Italian Society of Chemistry, uh, Reaxis at Sevier, Wiley as uh, Europe Chemistry, uh, Adritelf, Fondazione Umberto Veronesi, Chemistry Views. Thanks to all of them, uh, we had the opportunity to make our conference uh, uh, huge and to have a very important speaker. So the Dean of our department, Professor Angela Zampella was not able to be here for other meetings. So she wish us and she wish you all the, the best for this conference. And uh, I think that uh, it's time to start with our first plenary invited lecture that we are very, we're very glad to have uh, Professor Luigi Mondello from the University of, uh, of Messina. He's a full professor of analytical chemistry and his research is focused on the development of uh, chromatographic uh, and uh, um, chromatographic techniques like uh, GC, GC, LC, and also if not the technique and uh, is the author of more than 500 papers and more than uh, 1,300 conference presentation with an H index of 70. And he received a lot of a lot of prize and uh, he, has he, been, has been, he has been inserted in the in the list of more influential researchers in the field of separation separation science uh, from the Analytical Scientist magazine, and uh, he got a lot of recognition. So like the Canary Medal, uh, Dugo Medal, uh, Herbert uh, Dutton Award, and a lot of else. So we're very happy to have uh, Professor Mondello with us and to listen to his contribution, his lecture. So Professor Mondello. Yes, when, when thank you. Ready, can start. Yes, I'm going to share the, the screen. Okay, so uh, good morning to everybody and uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the scientific committee and uh, in particular the chair of the organizing committee, Dr. Stefano Cinti for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. Um, before starting, uh, let me to give a short overview of the presentation. So when uh, uh, Stefano invited me for giving uh, this lecture, I immediately uh, thought to speak uh, about innovative advanced uh, analytical methods for the analysis of lipids in uh, biological fluid, in particular in uh, human blood. So during this lecture, uh, I will focus uh, on the importance of advanced lipid analysis in blood and discuss the information of the single fatty acid composition, ratios, and indices, 
And uh, then uh, we'll focus uh, on innovative collection step and automation of the entire process by using a, a robotic uh, preparative station for derivatization, extraction of uh, fatty acid methyl ester, and evaluation of uh, the quantitative result by using a standard uh, reference material. Uh, then uh, we present some resulting uh, results regarding uh, um, new approach for the analysis uh, of uh, intact uh, fraction of the limits and uh, approach uh, for separation of uh, uh, triglycerides, uh, uh, cholesterol esters, uh, phospholipids, and other lipid classes by uh, non aqueous HPLC. Uh, reverse the phase uh, and uh, some multidimensional technologies such as comprehensive GC and, uh, and LC. Uh, so, well, uh, as you know, lipids are very important uh, for their function and their uh, profile uh, can be related to many common illness. Uh, in particular, uh, phospholipids are involved in many CN CNS disorders included, but not limited to Alzheimer, uh, Parkinson, uh, multiple uh, sclerosis and schizophrenia. And uh, it's also very well known the involvement uh, of uh, total cholesterol, uh, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and uh, intact uh, triglycerides in cardiovascular disease. So behind the fact uh, the triglycerides are the dominant uh, lipids in food. Also, uh, the minor uh, fraction uh, represented by the phospholipids uh, and other class like fat soluble vitamins, uh, monoglycerols, uh, diglycerols, wax are um, very important. So, um, as we know, uh, lipidomics is a branch of the metabolomics and aims to uh, full characterize uh, lipids and their biological roles, uh, considering also protein involved in lipid metabolism and function. And so from the biological point of view, um, a sample, uh, we can apply advanced analytical tools like uh, uh, the very well-known gas chromatography or lipid chromatography hyphenated to mass spectrometry, but also in combination of uh, uh, multidimensional approach like air cutting, multidimensional cutting or comprehensive approach. But however, uh, with the information uh, obtained, we can look to specific disease markers and draw some conclusion on the health status of the patient. Uh, so gas chromography, lead chromography are very well known, mostly uh, in the last uh, decades, I've added to spectroscopic or spectrometric uh, technology. They have some advantage. Uh, for example, we can get more reliable identification of indi individual uh, lipid species. Uh, we can get the separation of isomers or isobars. Um, we can also reduce the ion suppression effect in mass spectrometry. And for sure, we can go to uh, detect, detect, uh, detect trace level amount of these components. Um, these benefits are much more important when two different selectivity are used, enabling uh, uh, or enhancing the resolving power, as we see uh, at the end of this uh, lecture with uh, comprehensive uh, uh, approaches. Uh, so a typical workflow uh, in lipidomics uh, foresee uh, lipid extraction, uh, chromatography separation, MS detection, sometimes for untargeted or class specific or target uh, components. And uh, from a certain sample, uh, we can either directly uh, transesterify uh, or extract with a mixture of organic solvent and then derivatize uh, the fatty acid or subjected uh, the extracted lipids to a liquid chromatography 
hyphenated with the mass spectrometry and analyze uh, triglycerides, uh, sphingolipids, phospholipids, uh, cholesterol or cholesterol esters. Um, today, uh, one of the major aspect of this discipline is most linked to improving the environmental aspect uh, with the different approach, for example, with the non-invasive or minimal uh, sample size uh, and number. And also from the uh, part of the sample treatment, uh, we can reduce uh, the steps, uh, we can reduce uh, the use of energy, uh, reagent uh, from a renewable source, uh, safety of operator and so on. And uh, also from the instrumental part, uh, we can have a direct integrated operation and process uh, automation, miniaturization, and also in this case, a minimal use of uh, energy. Uh, here, uh, we propose uh, uh, a liquid profile test uh, to evaluate the general health state and the lifestyle of the patient by collecting uh, finger blood on dry blood spot and the complete autom automatization for the realization and extraction of the fatty acid methylacers. So the accuracy also of this method has been tested with um, a standard reference material from NIST and the lipidomic test analysis certificate uh, has been produced directly from the instrument. Um, so regarding uh, uh, DBS collecting, uh, uh, I need to, to give you a little overview uh, regarding uh, red blood cell. As you know, plasma membrane or red blood cell have been proposed for many years as the most important tool for assessing the quality uh, of fatty acid constituents as uh, erythrocytes, lipid composition, reflect the general condition of the organism and mostly is not affected by the daily uh, diet. However, the extraction of erythrocytes, lipids is quite difficult and laborious. And recently, uh, a study uh, has been done for validate a rapid method uh, suitable for large scale population studies for total blood fatty acid assay. And this study has confirmed that working on the whole blood, the same result are obtained in working on the more complex uh, erythrocytes lipid. So uh, as we can see uh, from this slide, uh, the standard method is quite uh, laborious uh, because it's using a, a, a centrifuge uh, or storing uh, the sample at the minus 70 degrees Celsius in isotonic buffer. And then the red blood cell were uh, leased, precipitated, centrifugated again, and also washed several times to eliminate the hemoglobin, hemoglobin residue. Uh, in, uh, in, in the simple direct derivation methods, uh, it's uh, quite easy and we can uh, uh, starting from this point. So we tried to apply uh, DBS as an alternative to conventional blood sampling. And DB DBS, as you can see from here, has many advantages. Um, for example, it's simple, inexpensive, uh, don't, uh, does not require high training, trained technician. Uh, capillary blood collection is a direct approach and the pageant uh, finger, uh, it's uh, pricked and the whole blood uh, drop uh, is spotted on a filter paper. And uh, more in detail, uh, we see here, uh, we collect uh, 50 microliter drop in, uh, by punching the fingertip. Uh, the blood is absorbed on a strip of uh, the DBS and uh, the drop is spotted into the middle point of the collection area, as you can see here in the, in the figure. And um, also the sample can be stored for around one or two weeks to prevent the loss of polyunsaturated fatty acid. And that blood is transferred into the auto sampler vial with the metal cup. So um, blood 
collected on DBS does not require to be centrifuged, uh, separated, or immediately frozen. So also a cold chain is not required, and most analytes remain stable, as I said before, at the room temperature and for longer period in, uh, in a freezer. Um, very important uh, for the collection of blood on DBS is what is reported here in this slide, that the US Department of Transportation and the US Postal Cyber consider DBS to be non-regulated and extemp material for shipping if they are properly packaged, making uh, it easy uh, to return the DBS uh, card from a clinic or for home directly to the lab for testing. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we also miniaturize, miniaturize the, um, the sample uh, extraction and derivatization. As you see here, we use a 500 microliter of uh, medosylate, uh, sodium medosylate, uh, vortexing, uh, vortexing uh, eating at 95 degrees, and then uh, also adding a liquid of BF3 in methanol, vortexing, and uh, finally uh, adding only 300 microliter of heptane uh, together with the saturated uh, sodium chloride solution, uh, vortexing, and uh, in total, uh, we use around 1.6 milliliter of reagent and solvent and a total time of around 40 minutes for uh, derivatization and extraction. Uh, however, it must be noted here that this procedure can be done in batch and during the GC run time and optimize for faster uh, analysis time. So uh, here is reported the full instrument that is integrated on the top of the GC FID MS system. Um, in particular, uh, the park station syringe for different volume syringe that is important for handling uh, uh, different volume and for reducing also the washing procedure when it's used only one syringe. Uh, another important aspect is also the cross-contamination that is also uh, avoided as each syringe is uh, handling uh, only one reagent or only one uh, solvent. So that's uh, here is a report of the GCFID chromatogram obtained on a particular capillary column that is an ionic liquid stationary phase where uh, you can see baseline separated most of the uh, fatty acid methyl esters. And as I said before, we did also some calibration. This, this is an example for the quantitative results obtained with the, the method described before. Uh, on the top, we have the uh, calibration curve of stearic, and on the below, we have the arachitonic acid. And uh, comparing uh, uh, the results that we obtained by using the standard reference material, you see here in the first graph, uh, the main fatty acid comparing with the calibration curve uh, with the two different methods. The blue one is the certified standard reference material while the green one is another certified reference material containing 37 uh, fatty acid methyl ester. And uh, uh, here uh, you see also um, the, um, the results for the minor uh, components. Another aspect that I don't, unfortunately, don't have time to uh, better uh, explain uh, is the reduction of the runtime uh, on the GC uh, part. As you see here, we uh, compare two different chromatograms. One is obtained on conventional uh, GC column, where we have almost 50 minutes uh, uh, for dilution of the linoleic acid. Uh, by using a narrow bore uh, capillary column with the, the same ionic liquid phase, we can reduce this time to around 1.4 uh, minutes and uh, maintaining the same phase ratio, so the ratio between the stationary phase and uh, the mobile phase at the same uh, level. 
just to um, give you some uh, um, some comment on what we uh, I, I will present later on the final uh, quantitative results. Um, uh, apart uh, the single fat acid in the final report, we can uh, we can comment on the information we obtain for the single uh, fatty acid. For example, here it's reported the import. Uh, synthesized, sorry, by multi-enzymatic uh, system. Uh, we have also uh, the importance here of a monounsaturated fatty acid uh, from the biosynthesis or uh, from the diet. And in this case, uh, uh, later I will focus more on uh, some enzyme like the Delta-9 desaturase uh, index that is the ratio of the stearic acid uh, and the oleic acid. They give information on the enzyme efficiency uh, that is converting the stearic to oleic, or uh, with the same uh, enzyme, uh, the conversion of uh, palmitic to palmitoleic. I think uh, Lu Luigi. Yeah, I we, we cannot see your 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 presentation. Yeah, I'm trying to. I don't know. There was uh, some interruption. Uh, probably you see again now. Uh, not, not yet. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so for example here, um, it's an example where we can see how it's possible to change this ratio by integrating, for example, with the nodes uh, that is containing palmidolic acid. In this case, it's uh, macadamia uh, nodes. So we can change uh, and act uh, as uh, with the diet on, on, on this ratio. Um, uh, regarding uh, uh, now uh, the, the most important uh, part that is related to, um, for example, to other uh, class of uh, components, uh, for example, here uh, we have uh, uh, the monounsaturated fatty acid uh, is something okay. Um, well, the SCD1, so the seroil uh, coenzyme desaturase, is implicated in a variety of the metabolic disorders such as obesity or insulin resistance or diabetes. And so plasma fatty acid ratio, uh, such as the SCD desaturation index, hold the potential uh, to serve as a non-invasive and sensitive predictors for early stage of this chronic uh, disease. And uh, we have also some uh, uh, other uh, comments on, uh, for example, on uh, Delta-12 desaturase and Delta-15 desaturase that may act uh, on oleic acid in succession and operate to the hydrogenation step. But however, as we know, these two enzymes are present only in plant, in plant cell. And uh, also uh, very important uh, uh, is the cellular membrane ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. This is important because of the stress response we use uh, uh, either uh, one without discrimination and the omega-6 fatty acid uh, are more likely to promote inflammation. So the standard Western diet uh, has a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, sometime like 15 to 1, and is associated with inflammation condition. So by supplementing fish oil, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is reduced and can reduce inflammation and lower susceptibility to various chronic diseases common among uh, industrialized uh, society. And uh, uh, also, finally, um, both um, alpha uh, linolenic acid, what we call ALA, uh, that is a type of omega-3, and the linoleic acid, that is an omega-6, compete for desaturate, 
desaturase enzyme that are responsible to converting them into uh, EPA, so aga penta senoic acid and arachidonic acid uh, respectively. Uh, and the, finally, uh, we, wish, we will see later on, uh, on the results, uh, we have also some uh, uh, importance about the Delta-5 desaturase index that is looking the arachidonic and uh, the, the gamma, uh, the homo gamma leononeic acid, and where high value indicate the presence of inflammation and uh, or for example, shortage of mineral salt or B vitamins, and also the Delta-6, the Sadurase plus the elongase index, where the linoleic is um, converted to uh, the homo gamma linoleic acid that evaluates the function of enzyme involved with the metabolism of the omega-6 fatty acid. So uh, finally, um, very important, this is one of the first analysis that's been made in blood, is the ratio between arachidonic and EPA. It pro provides information about the health and the state of the human organism. And it's also served to balance the inflammatory effect of the uh, excess of the arachidonic acid. So that is uh, um, uh, what we... we uh, um, have uh, in uh, in the certificate that is as I said produced directly from the instrument. Um, here we can see some information about the test and uh, the patient. Uh, we have uh, thirty one fatty acid methyl ester with the quantitative data reported and also some reference value uh, coming from the literature, normal value. Um, so we can understand if there is something that is not uh, in this range. Also, as I said, we have some different ratio or indices uh, including total saturated fatty acid, total monounsaturated, total poly polyunsaturated, uh, omega-6 index, omega-3 index, the ratio between these two, last two, and some information about the uh, enzyme. So delta-9 uh, and delta-6, both for, um, uh, for stearic and oleic, or palmitic and palmidoleic. And finally, we have also uh, delta-5 desaturase index that is looking the arachidonic and the homo gamma linoleic acid and the ratio between arachidonic and EPA. So as you see, we have a, uh, a plenty of information. And uh, so the consequence of that uh, is, for example, for uh, I cannot discuss all the single fatty acids or the ratio, but I give you an example. For example, for um, number uh, 15, that is uh, the alpha linolenic acid, uh, there is a comment on uh, the result that the lipid profile showed a deficiency of alpha linolenic acid. As you see, this is also an explanation why alpha linoleic acid, that is a polyunsaturated acid from the omega-3 family. And uh, like the omega-6 linoleic acid is an essential fatty acid uh, because it's synthesized by the organism, uh, it's not synthesized by the organism. And uh, the main function of this fatty acid is the uh, platelet, platelet binding, vasoprotective, anti-inflammatory and anti-thrombotic. So the conclusion is that uh, in order to formalize a more suitable supplementation, it's recommended to follow nutritional claims and take regularly the nutraceutical if uh, they were prescribed. And uh, uh, the same is for uh, uh, the other, uh, all the other ratio like the enzyme or the ratio of uh, the arachidonic with the APA with some uh, information how to uh, change or, or modify the single fatty acid or the ratio of this fatty acid. So um, this is what is normally used, uh, uh, excluding the fact that we um, uh, we use a, uh, a robot to uh, for taking the sample preparation, the derivatization, so on. But the new frontier 
of this analysis are new approach. They are not based on the realization because as you know, when we um, uh, hydrolyze the lipids in general, so triglycerides, phospholipids, or whatever other kind of lipids, we obtain the single fatty acid information. Intact lipids, uh, it's uh, for a comprehensive understanding of the metabolic pathway. And in fact, as before, we did uh, some uh, uh, full automated sample preparation analysis. That is uh, another robot. Uh, different, it's um, very close to the clinical one used in, uh, in clinical analysis. This is including, including uh, via holder, uh, filtration, this is uh, also ultra filtration, so it's not, give, uh, it's not making uh, any centrifugation. Uh, vortex, uh, eating block, reagent, uh, disposal arm, uh, a sample disposal arm. So we can uh, uh, do everything in, in an automatic way. So uh, we reduced also here, uh, we, we went to uh, extraction of the lipids with the 20 microliter sample uh, applied on a DBS. And uh, we use a different reagent uh, like methanol or uh, chloroform. We had also a saturated solution, vortexing uh, to simulate what is very well known is the folk extraction that is made to extract the lipid from a certain matrix. And here is the uh, computer software where we can uh, uh, deliver the solvents. Uh, we can make some shaking, uh, uh, filtration, whatever is uh, needed for the extraction of the lipids. So what do we get from this information? We get uh, uh, on the DBS, a total lipidome uh, by uh, UHPLC. And also we can use uh, MSMS. And by using MSMS from this slide, for example, is presenting the triglycerides here and the cholesterol ester, while this part is uh, um, uh, possible to, uh, to show the um, phospholipids and the other components where you can see some uh, adduct uh, here. Uh, and uh, the different family we extracted. And in fact, if we look now to the chromatogram, uh, we look to the intact triglycerides, you can see not anymore the fatty acid, the total fatty acid, but you can see the triglycerides, uh, they are still intact and extracted from the blood. For example, here uh, we have a big peak that is uh, triglycerides with the eicosapentenoic uh, uh, stearic, stearic, uh, and uh, uh, we have some other according to the um, fatty acid decomposition. For example, here we have stearic, oleic, oleic, or a big one, palmitic, palmitic, palmitic. So from totally saturated to, uh, in the first part, totally unsaturated uh, triglycerides. However, we can do also a different approach. Uh, so using extension of this approach of intact triglycerides to the more polar lipids. Again, here uh, using uh, uh, partially porous uh, uh, stationary phase, we are able to separate in the first part the lysophospholipids, phospholipids, and you see here was in phospholipolene, or also uh, eluded with the diglycerides. And then in the last part, we can elute the triglycerides and the cholesterol ester. So we identified uh, 127 species uh, in total in the sample. And this is the list of uh, the identification of all the intact uh, lipids. So, well, um, I'm going to conclude, but I would like to show you also some uh, different approach that is based due to the complexity of our sample we still have some collusion if even if we use uh, for example the the first separation i presented we use a two column in series of uh, uh, monodispersed particles or very high efficiency but still we have uh, some collusion so the solution to that is to use multidimensional chromatography or comprehensive chromatography where 
each component there is eluded from a first column is directed, directed into a second column. And between the two columns, we have the modulator. So we can do this approach in gas chromatography, so with the fatty acid the medilaster. So the cross here means that you have um, a, a comprehensive approach. So this comprehensive approach means that you have uh, a is then separated to the second call. It's changing something on the visualization and uh, also on um, the quantification. And in fact, uh, the normal chromatogram where we have uh, each peak that is uh, sliced in different uh, fraction, then it's converted to a uh, through a mat mathematical matrix to a contour plot. And uh, the visualization is uh, completely different from a normal chromatogram. Just to show you uh, what is the effect. The effect, this is again is a sample of a human plasma. And you can see in the first part, we, in the first column, we have a non-polar column. So we are separating the uh, fatty acid the methylester according to the number of carbon, so according to the molecular weight, so to, to the volatility. While in the second column, where we have the polar column, we are separating the fatty acid the methylester according to the number of double bonds. And in fact, if we uh, zoom uh, area from C10 to C15, you can see that we have a very well ordered chromatogram where we can also see some uh, connection between, for example, the C15 family. Uh, we have uh, not only the normal C15, but we have also isomers. So we have uh, uh, other uh, C15 with uh, one or more double bond, but this is more uh, visible, for example, in the region of uh, C20, where we have uh, the C20 uh, with, uh, without a double bond, very well ordered with the one, with the two, with the three, with the four, and with the five. And in the same time, we can have also a line that is connecting the fatty acid. They are the uh, double bond in the same position. For example, these two, 20 uh, with the four, with the five, are the single double bond in position omega-3. So it's very well ordered uh, information. And uh, so I'm going to conclude. Finally, we can do the same, uh, not in GC, but with the intact limits. For example, in comprehensive LC, where we have a different uh, transfer a device is a 10 port valve, uh, you see here on the bottom with the two column, same effect as in GC, uh, in comprehensive GC. Everything from the first column is going to the second column. This time is kept in a loop. And uh, uh, what we use here, we use a complete different selectivity. So in the first dimension, we use a silver ion um, session phase. So it's separating the triglycerides according to the number of double bond. While in the second dimension, we use a non aqueous reverse the phase uh, leak chromatography where the triglycerides are separated according to the uh, partition number, that is the number of the total carbon present in the structure minus two times the double bond. What do we get? You see, we get a complete figure of what is the intact molecules in our uh, blood. And in, in the left part, we have the cholesterol esters. Uh, separated according to the double bond in the first dimension and according to the fatty acid present in, 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 in the ester. And while in the second part, on the right part, you can see the figures rights uh, uh, organized according to the number of double bond, but also according to the partition number. So the most uh, unsaturated are below here in this position, the most saturated are here in, in, in this position. So it's a very well ordered chromatogram. So uh, in conclusion, uh, and we integrate all the analytical steps starting from sample preparation 
data processing. We use a dry blood spot for collection and the method has proved to be a valid diagnostic tool and has been successfully employed to detect a specific pathological condition. We did also automatic mineralization of liquid uh, chromatography uh, platform, including extraction, and uh, for developing uh, uh, clinical lipid analysis aimed to increase the sample throughput and according to green chemistry rules. And finally, we uh, also demonstrate the use of tribal quad for high sensitivity and selectivity. And finally, multidimensional chromatography, in particular, comprehensive chromatography to increase the peak capacity of our system and explore separation and quantification of the total class of components. So with that, I would like to thank my research group and uh, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mondello, for your uh, very rich presentation. Uh, even if I think that you can stay talk longer, also if, uh, <laughs> if you yeah. ask you. So, thank you very much for all of this. So, I, I'm, I, I am really impressed by the the dry blood spot because okay, I work, I work in a different field, but my my idea was that this kind of techniques like chromatography was. Uh, was requiring a lot of uh, big instrumentation, of course, they need, but they also, uh, they, they need also very small, uh, very small uh, spots. So what, what you can say about this, so about the, the possibility to apply also this kind of uh, acquisition of sample to other techniques, for example, sensor. What do you think? What is your... your... Yeah, I mean, uh, that is a very interesting question because as you know, um, the main fact of collecting blood as a liquid has many disadvantages. So it's a biological sample. Uh, when you dry it on, on the paper, it's no more a biological sample. Uh, transportability, so you can send uh, even in a letter uh, the, 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 the little piece of uh, DBS paper. Uh, there are uh, also many other approach like sensors or using uh, uh, different technologies. If you are going, for example, to look to uh, Trajan Corporation, they are using a EMA pen. The EMA pen is a kind of a collection um, based on a little uh, piece of uh, different material where you can keep also in a different uh, uh, position inside the EMA pen, uh, the blood. So there are many approach uh, for sure miniaturization is very connected to a, a, a kind of sensor or whatever any other uh, you know uh, material that can be used for uh, blood collection the paper on dbs is quite new because as you know uh, the dbs originally was used for protein and for newborn screening and not for lipids and the paper it's containing also fatty acid. So we uh, did also a lot of research on that by collaborating uh, with the uh, company, uh, with the Merck that's producing the, the kind of material that's mostly as not to contain originally fatty acid. Otherwise you can contaminate with the, the fatty acid in the paper or in any other kind of natural support the the sample that you are analyzing. So I think there is a really open space to any kind of material that can be used to collect uh, blood. Yeah, there is a lot of opportunity, and I think that this uh, like uh, th this meeting can be you no know, uh, is very important because we, we can take a lot of this knowledge to be applied in different fields. So there is one one question from uh, from the audience. So for Professor Mondello, so Gerro, you can activate your, your audio. Okay, hello. Okay. Uh, are you all hearing me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. And then uh, for Professor uh, Luigi, Mondello. I'm, really, I'm really impressed with the plenary lecture. And then I must say I learned I learned some new things here. Um, my background is uh, analytical chemistry, but then now I'm um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm working with, uh, of course, analytical chemistry, but dealing with biological samples and mainly in hematology somehow. Um, one thing I learned here is using comprehensive uh, chromatographic techniques to deal with complex samples. That looks very, very interesting to me. That, that, that looks a bit, a bit new to me, it, like GC, GC, LC, LC. Yeah, that, that, that looks uh, very, very interesting to me. And uh, I'm just uh, a little bit curious. You, have, you are dealing with complex biological samples that have thousands of different kinds of materials. Um, how do you deal with separation of this, like dealing with their different illusion times so as to uh, avoid overlapping and be able to identify them. And then um, these are fatty acids. How do you figure out whether these are the actual intact ones? Because they could have been you know, uh, degraded along the way. How do you know that this is actually an intact one and then characterize it based on that? Well, that is a very, very good question and uh, merits a long time to, to discuss on, on this matter. Uh, as you said, um, a complex uh, uh, mixture are very difficult to, to manage as uh, even today we are using, uh, as I said before, uh, serial column, uh, partially porous compared to totally porous. So that means that we reduce the transfer, the mass transfer of the analytes by using uh, a partially porous uh, stationary phase. So we get a very high efficiency, so a very high number of plates. Still, uh, if we are going uh, to intact uh, triglycerides or phospholipids or whatever, it's uh, still uh, very difficult to, to separate all of them. So uh, comprehensive approach are very good because you can uh, uh, deal with uh, two different types of separation that normally we call orthogonal. What that means, orthogonal? Orthogonal means that you are using uh, one separation mechanism in one uh, uh, column. For example, the one I show you, uh, silver ion, is very interesting because it's uh, the, uh, uh, the pi Greek uh, bond. It's uh, uh, linked with the, the number of double bond you have in your triglycerides or in your phospholipids. So separation is according to the number of double bond. At the beginning, at that time, you, you have triglycerides without, uh, so totally saturated, like uh, uh, palmitic, 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 or whatever other saturated fatty acid. And then you have an increased uh, retention according to the number of double bond. In the other part, for example, we are using uh, non-aqueous because the reverse phase, you cannot use water with the lipid. We use a non-aqueous uh, um, reverse the phase separation where uh, the separation is according to the triglycerides or the phospholipids, uh, total carbon number, that is uh, called the PN, uh, minus a different way, uh, triglycerides, they are very high saturated or triglycerides, they are very high unsaturated. So that's, it's, uh, I think it's the, the same discussion we can do. Unfortunately, we don't have the time in GC, time GC or in comprehensive GC. You, you can use uh, this example I show you, non-polar. So you are separating fatty acid materials according to the volatility and to the molecular weight. So according to the number of carbon. And at the same time, you can use polar like the uh, polarity of the fatty acid. So uh, we are trying to get the more orthogonal. I'm oh, sorry. I can you hear me? Uh, I lost yes, the yes, now, for, yes, for, for a few seconds. So the, the second part of your question that is regarding how we can uh, see if uh, these uh, um, intact limits are not uh, metabolized or degraded during uh, the, uh, the, the way that has been in our body, 
uh, this is a very good question because what we are looking, uh, what you are looking normally when you go to a normal uh, analysis of uh, triglycerides, you are looking to still uh, the intact molecules, they are going into the blood. So this part is related to what is remaining after you digest or whatever is transferred from the, uh, the from your stomach, from your intestine, from your organ to the blood. And this is what what is we are looking. But as you know, when we look at uh, triglycerides or uh, LDL or HDL cholesterol, we are looking the one that is present in the circulating blood. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Thank you, Gerro. And uh, thank you again, Professor Mondello, to uh, add value at this conference with your uh, experience and your very good research. Thank you again for being here. And thank you uh, to you for the invitation. We, we hope you can, uh, you can assist the rest of the conference, but in case, thank you from all the committee of the, of the conference. Thank you, Thank you very again. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, now it's time for the for the for the second uh, for the for the second speaker that is uh, uh, an invited speaker, and uh, I give the the words to <laughs> to Nuncia. Okay, sorry, we have some problem with our computer. Okay, so good morning, everyone, and now it's time for Bexod. Kakimov is a uh, graduated in chemistry at University of London, Queen Mary, and then he got his PhD in metabolomics at University of Copenhagen, where he's actually working now as an associate professor. So he analyzed every kind of biological metrics by using NMR and mass spectrometry. So back up, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I try to... Uh to first put my video on, which is not stable, just to prove that I'm a real person because my <laughs> camera is not working correctly. So I will switch it off and then I start sharing my screen. Okay. okay. Please let me know if you can see a full screen. Yeah, it's perfect. Can you do that? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me for this uh, interesting conference, Nuntia. So I'm gonna give you a very small uh, brief overview of our latest research in what is called uh, lipoproteins. So you all probably have heard about what is lipoproteins are. And in this small presentation, I'm gonna show you how we can predict the lipoproteins using NMR spectra and why it's important and how we do it. Lipoproteins are small micellar-like uh, vehicles, you can call them, is a small particles always floating in the blood. And what are they? Well, they are nothing else than just a compact uh, so-called um, polymers that are stuck together. So it could be uh, proteins and they are the most what second most abundant molecules and there are fatty acids and there are cholesterols and phospholipids and apolipoprotein b and a you have all heard from probably some, what is called vldl or ldl so these are the uh, very normal clinical parameters when you go to hospital and do a normal blood test so any lipoprotein molecule consists of seven molecules. So here I list six of them. So that these are cholesterol. It could be cholesterol attached to the lipoprotein or cholesterols attached to the uh, floating in the, in the blood as a free cholesterol. And there are the cholesterol esters, triglycerides and phospholipids and apolipoprotein A and B. So you can see from this Ghent, uh, from this uh, yes, scatter plot. So the lipoproteins, they differ by density and diameters. The largest ones, we call them chylomicrons. And these are the 
lipoproteins that occur in your blood or immediately after your uh, food intake, and then they disappear. What we always have is so-called four main fractions. It's VLDL, IDL, and, and uh, LDL, and HDL. So why are they important? Lipoproteins are probably the most important, uh, what is called uh, non-cell particles, you may call in, 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 in our uh, body. And their function is critical. They are the vehicles which carry the lipid molecules in our uh, bloodstream. Blood is mainly consi consists of water. So that's very logical that the lipid won't be able to travel in water unless they are somehow packed. And this packing uh, particle is lipoproteins. So we call them vehicles, basically. And why they are important? Well, they are, first of all, important for our metabolism. I mean, they carry lipids. And I don't need to mention what, why lipids are important, but they also carry some sort of uh, uh, information about our cardiovascular system. And these, they are the only markers that have been clinically proven to be used in the clinics, basically in hospitals, to make some assessment of the risk of cardiovascular diseases that one is developing. It could be stenosis, it could be an ischemic diseases of the heart, or it could be any other diseases. Of course, not all the diseases are predictable but by, by lipoproteins. They are the risk factors for the, mostly for the uh, angina, for developing angina and stenosis. And very, very established uh, markers are the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and the ratio of LDL cholesterol to HDL cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol, we call them bad cholesterol, and HDL are the, we call them good cholesterols. Okay, so it is important to quantify this because it is important for doctors to assess uh, how are we doing in terms of our cardiovascular system. Classical and golden standard method is ultracentrifugation that takes eight days. And this we have done in Copenhagen uh, back four years ago. And it really took one and a half years to measure three, 350 samples. And it is a golden standard and it is a commercial. There are many companies doing this in the world, but there is also faster alternatives that are based on either HPLC or NMR. So I'm gonna talk about NMR, these fast alternatives. And these alternatives came around already in early nineties, but they have not been established or validated for the larger cohort. And this is what we have done. And this is what I'm going to show you. So in NMR spectra, this is a one dimensional proton NMR spectra. This is typical, what we call it a noisy spectra. And there is this particular region, we call them, lipoprotein region. So it's basically an aliphatic region where we can see a, a methyl and methylene combined protons from the uh, fatty acids. And this particular region, which range from 0.6 to 1.4, it carries an information about the lipoproteins. And it carries information not only on the intensity of the proton NMR spectral resonances, but also on their shape and on their chemical shift. So this is a very, very valuable information which have been used, but we want to get this one step ahead and we want to use it in an automated way and we want to use it in a reproducible way. So one can just measure proton animal spectra of human blood and predict the lipoproteins. So this effort to develop such a fast and standardized and validated method have been initiated uh, in, so we have, we had a big uh, project in Denmark called Counter-Strike that was all about counteracting age-related skeletal muscle loss. So basically sacropenia. And in that project, we ask a simple question. Okay, so we, can we measure human blood and mass spectra and predict lipoproteins in Denmark, in Netherlands, in Germany, in Australia, in New Zealand, and can we, can we really talk to each other? Are we measuring the same stuff? Is it compatible across lab? Because science is scattered. Data are lab dependent. 
people got tired of generating data which cannot be reproduced across labs. And this, we, yeah, we tried to kind of put an end to this point, at least when it comes to the NMR spectroscopy. So we have done a ring test. We optimized measurement of the human blood NMR spectra together with a vendor company, Brooker, using very optimized and standardized strict protocols. They call it the in vitro research diagnostics protocols these days. So we, we concluded that it is possible to measure and it is reproducible. And yes, we can predict lipoproteins. So what is next? So we have developed the method, we published the paper. Then we came back to our original cohort where we have 360 Danish people. So we basically withdraw the fasting blood plasma samples. We measured NMR and on parallel, we measured lipoprotein concentrations, absolute concentrations in milligram deciliter using use ultra centrifugation. Very laborious method, this yellow part, it takes eight days, so we have done that. So now we've got the com uh, comprehensive data, which are uh, on the same subject. We measure Elema and UC. So what we can do now is we can basically, what we learned from our previous study, so we learn how to process the spectra, we learn how to standardize the spectra, how to align it, and how to build the models. So we try to apply these methods and we, comprehensively validated what is called partial least squares regression models, PLS models, in order to predict from the NMR spectra, absolute concentrations of lipoproteins. And yeah, sorry, this is a little bit complex slide, but I will show you the link later. You can read if you're interested. So basically we do a two, uh, two step validation, two step optimization. So we first clean the, the data, the spectral data, and we search for which spectral interval is most interesting to predict, and then we validate the PLS. And then we uh, applied our models to, com to completely independent samples of Swedish people, approximately the same number of subjects. Okay, this is very much to show, but this is basically what we have done. Uh, it is, it is a little bit pity to say that regardless of the NMR spectra has been established to measure lipoproteins some time ago, we haven't found any comprehensive study where people search for other spectral regions which, are, which can be informative for, for, for predicting lipoproteins. So here we have done this comprehensive work. It's too much to show, but basically what we have done is we took entire NMR spectra, we chopped it in smaller intervals, and we did that in a way that using the knowledge, we, we knew that here is a methyl of the cholesterol molecule. We know that this is a methyl of the fatty acids, termin terminal methyl groups. So these are the, the methylene of the fatty acids. So using this prior knowledge, we pre-selected intervals and compared them, which of these data sets, which of these intervals are best for predicting lipoproteins. So we have done so very comprehensively. And we found out that 20 of these 33 intervals, they are competitive to each other. But however, what we call it region nine. So <clears throat> region nine is the one, is, is this one. I hope you can see my mouse. It turns out to be the most optimal region for predicting lipoproteins. So here you can see it's a region 10. It's exactly the same as region nine, but we left out the interfering small molecule. So this is a lactic acid in our blood. So we removed that and tried to model and we include that and tried to model. And we have done so for all the other combinations and we compared them. And we picked the one which gives consistently uh, best prediction performances. I mean, consistently true quantification of lipoproteins in human blood. So we picked the, the interval, so that we call it LP region 0.6 to 1.4 ppm, and we predicted all the lipoproteins which have been measured by reference method ultra centrifugation. And here is some of the examples. You can see that we can quantify easily uh, very low density triglycerides, 
and the same molecules in intermediate uh, density lipoproteins and LDL cholesterol and H, even we can predict uh, very small subfractions of HDLs, what is called HDL2B uh, or HDL3A. So we came up with a set of models and we tested our set of models, which have been now optimized. Optimized means we found optimal number of latent variables in PLS models. So basically how many uh, PLS components we need in order to get such a model. And we evaluated basically the model performance parameters. And we used exact the same training models to predict the Swedish people now. So we got the NMR spectra of the, uh, of, of the uh, cohort from Sweden. And we tried to predict lipoproteins in those subjects and then compare it with their reference values. And surprisingly, for those which are compatible across two different cohorts, we were uh, up to 85 to 95% matching. So this is a solid proof that the method is valid and method is transferable. So we were happy and we started to, to write our story and share with the world, but we are also critical scientists. So then immediately, uh, data scientists can ask or did ask a question. So how come using such a small spectral region where the rank, where the, let's say, mathematical variation may not be the same as the number of variables you are predicting? So we say that we can predict 65 human blood lipoproteins. So in, usually in clinic, you do like two, three of them, yeah? So here we can do 65 of them and in less than 20 minutes. So we have been chased by the data scientists. So we try to investigate, is it really possible? Are we overfitting or are we uh, predicting the same thing twice? So we have done what is called a, a rank analysis. Here, I'm just showing you the heat map of the Y actual. So this is the concentrations of the, uh, this is the correlation of the lipoproteins to each other in the, in the reference from the reference method, ultra centrifugation, and we call it Y hat. So this is a predicted, PLS based predicted uh, lipoproteins. And we can see that concentration has not changed. They are not significantly changed. So this is a proof that our methods are not overfitted. Our models are not overfitted. So we have done something called a rank estimation. So this, relies on a hypothesis that the mathematical rank, so basically mathematical rank of the NMR spectra should be equal to the chemical variation, basically how many components chemicals are present in that NMR spectral region. So we have done that using the PCA-based iterative approach. You can find in the, in the paper how it is done and also the reference uh, chemometric method for that. So we actually found out that it is true, that it is true that the rank is 83. So it is very well possible that there are 65 different components in the NMR spectra, in the NMR spectra. So we estimated the rank of our data, spectral data as 83. And the same we have done with estimating the Swedish cohort NMR spectra, and we found the rank is 92 there. So 92 different chemicals might be present in that range, in, in, in this LP region of the NMR spectra. And Swedish cohorts showed a little bit high. Well, we were wondering why is that? Then we went back to the data, metadata, and looked at actually the population recruited in the Swedish cohort were much more heterogeneous than ours. Danish cohort were mainly uh, two thirds of them were elderly people, so 65 and higher. While Swedish cohort were much more heterogeneous. So it is true that rank could be, could be uh, higher here. So we have done so for the LP data. And we found that our LP data itself also very complex. So we, we can see that there are 33 uh, independent variations. So this, this then made us to handshake with a statistician, critical statistician who, who, who didn't believe that this could not be a case. So this in fact could be the case. So we were happy, 
But then the chemist asks a very simple question. So what are the animal signals that are responsible for predicting the LP regions? So from the PLS models, it's really difficult. I mean, from the NMR spectra, it's really difficult to say what peak is, is most responsible for predicting VLDL and what is the peak uh, NMR signal which is responsible for predicting, let's say, LDL cholesterol. So that we try to understand and answer using what is called a selectivity ratio data. So selectivity ratio is nothing else than the spectral profile, which we obtain from the PLS models that kind of illustrates or reflects the importance of the NMR spectral variables for predicting the lipoproteins. So we have done this very comprehensive investigation. We compared different uh, selectivity ratios of which are obtained from VLDL predicting models, IDL and HDL. And conclusion is that, yes, they are informative and selectivity ratios are mainly size dependent. So you can see that regardless of what molecular you we quantify, it could be triglycerides, cholesterol, or phospholipids, apolipoproteins. When these molecules are part of the VLDL particle, they have the same signature NMR spectral profile. So that was our conclusion. And of course, this implies that if it takes the same molecule, let's say triglycerides, across different particles, they have different spectral profile. So spectral profile, which are responsible for predicting these molecules in different particles, they are different. They are different both in shape and in the chemical shift. And this is probably the, uh, this is a discovery of course. So, so we call it proudly unique predictors of, uh, of lipoproteins. But these predictors, of course, must be validated in a large, larger cohorts. Okay, just to conclude, what we have done is in this uh, effort to build the rapid models for predicting human blood lipoproteins. So we established a methodology how to process the proton NMR spectra. So we basically uh, learned and established how to align and what to do with the raw NMR spectra. And we, we then learn what is the real model complexity. We optimize each and every PLS model for separate individual lipoprotein particles. And this we then validated on independent cohort. So to, yeah, to tell the truth, so we, we basically reduced eight days of measurement time for LP quantification to 20 minutes. And proudly enough, of course, we then developed an open access software for allow you guys or anyone else in the world to use our model in open access software, where you basically need to load your NMR spectra and you get out uh, predicted lipoproteins of, for each individual. And this paper is now under review and this is a bioarchive. There's a DOI of it, so you can read if you are interested in. So about the software, what we have done, we developed uh, uh, what is called signature mapping software some time ago for processing NMR metabolomics data. So we extended the software, adding one more option where user now can process not only metabolomics, but also the lipoprotein uh, data. So, so it's very easy. Uh, this is a uh, GitHub link to download. It's a free, so free software, MATLAB-based uh, develop. So you can, you can download you can load your NMR spectra. And basically there is an instruction in the, on the, there is also a YouTube manual how to use it. So you basically can check your NMR spectra that you load and it will standardize. It will uh, change your spectra if it's very different. It will standardize to the, to the reference spectra which is based on our models, based on our data. And it will use uh, our optimized PLS models for predicting each and every lipoprotein separately. So, and this, of course, is sigma, sigma mapping software. It's not only limited to predicting lipoproteins, but you can do this uh, for different sample matrices as well. So we call it a mouse click away metabolite uh, data. So you basically can, uh, load your NMR spectra and, and define what sample matrix you are working on. 
it could be a plasma urine fecal and we are extending this uh, to different food matrices also and the software will understand that what metabolites to expect from this from these matrices and find the chemical shift ranges of the metabolites and, and quantify them and finally you you basically get an, a metabolite table out well you can ask why why you have done why don't you use just a spectra itself well it's very difficult especially it's very difficult when if you work with the large cohorts where you have hundreds of thousands of spectra there will be a misalignments there will be overlappings all sort of complexity that will uh, prevent you to do a proper statistics so that's why you need to tabulate so you need to make a metabolite table instead so this is one of my postdoc uh, also italian alessia crying looking at the uh, urine and our spectra uh, what to do so this is actually the reason why we developed sigma it's very simple uh, it takes it, it basically uh, recognizes all the signature signals of the metabolites that are present in a given sample matrix it aligns them and then it it applies what is called the multivariate curve resolution based uh, uh, area estimation of the of the signature signals and and then it converts it into absolute concentrations okay our um, enough about sigma uh, but this is a very typical example of how one signal is processed in the software. So, for example, this is in a doublet of ALA9 in a row spectral region. So, so sigma aligns uh, that ALA9 and sigma subtracts and removes a baseline and then models. So you basically go all the way from the row interval, which looks like this, to something like that. And it will give you more accurate data. By definition. Okay. Uh, yes, this is a different uh, windows how it op how it works, and this is a typical uh, Excel sheet uh, when you generate finally your metabolite table, so ready to go for the statistics. <clears throat> okay. Uh, just very few slides before we uh, end the session. Uh, at least my talk. So this has been extended to human urine and it is published. This has been extended to human fecal metabolome and standardized and it is also published. And in these publications, you can also find not only the, the chemical shift libraries and the, how to use the software, but also the protocols which are standardized now for, for comprehensive human fecal metabolomics. Okay, with that, I would like to just thank you, and I will not talk about pros and cons of the, of the, of the Sigma, but uh, yeah, you are more than welcome to contact me if you are interested in using a Sigma either for lipoprotein quantification or for metabolite quantification. And I would like to thank my colleagues and the developers of the Sigma. So it's uh, uh, Nabi Moboraki and it's Alessio Trimino and it's Violetta Aru and Soren Balling Engelsen. And this is uh, basically an overview of our KU Foodomics lab at Copenhagen University where Nuncia spent uh, approximately half a year with me working in that corner or in that corner, I don't remember, doing uh, also fecal analysis. So I hope that we can collaborate and, 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 and uh, keep, it, keep in touch, yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you, Baxo. And congratulations, this was such a huge work. So I will definitely use this, uh, this software. I think it's super nice. And if Thank nobody you. has questions, I see no hands raised, so. Um, I actually have a curiosity. Tell me. Uh, in order to use this uh, Sigma software, do I need to prepare the sample according to some uh, precise procedures, I guess? Or I, I can use it even if I have NMR spectra of some biological fluid prepared, like, I don't know, one year ago, in, according to my, my protocol. Can I still use the software or mm, do I need to, to follow some specific standard operating procedures? Yeah, that's extremely good question. So let me enlarge this part of the presentation. Can you see that still? Yeah. Yeah, so here 
Uh, mm -hmm. It is. It is yes. If you have already prepared using the same protocol as us, it will be easier for you. But it is definitely not necessary. Okay. So what you can do is you can load any NMR spectra, which can be very different than what we measure. Then we have something called here options. So it's here you can see load options. Mm -hmm. So I cannot click here, of course. But if you click here, drop down menu, there will be something called custom. So custom means uh, it could, you know, it could be any sample matrix which is not listed in our library. So let's say you are analyzing cancer cells or something, then you can define your own. And then the only thing you need to do extra is then we don't have the chemical shift library for your new sample. So you need to define it yourself. I mean, taking from the literature or databases. So it's one extra uh, step work required for you if you did not follow the uh, protocol, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. It's definitely possible, yeah. Okay, and I see that I can also choose the normalization method that I prefer, I see. Yes, yes. there are all, the, all sorts of normalization which is possible to use. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Really no, nice no. work, congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Bye. And unfortunately, I have to leave the conference. Yeah, sorry for the- Don't worry, no problem. Thank you again. Thanks for inviting, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, so now it's time for Giovanni Ventura. Yes. Okay, Giovanni is from University of Bari, Aldo Mora, and is going to present ALERT and automated workflow to identify putative food allergenic proteins of edible insects. So Giovanni, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, my name is Ronnie Ventura. And uh, as you said, uh, today we'll talk about uh, um, insect allergens uh, uh, analyzed by Isul Allergy. It is a MATLAB-based software that uh, we have developed. Uh, I want to thank the scientific committee for this opportunity. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, food allergy is a significant health problem whose incidence has been growing steadily in recent years. And the many studies have focused on the 14 main allergenic foods, ascertaining proteins that are responsible for allergenicity and their market peptides used for identification and quantification. Uh, due to constant demographic growth, new protein sources are gradually incoming into our eating habits. And today, yes, the fungi, bacteria, algae, and insects with high protein, vitamin, and uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid contents, and also low environmental impact, low production price, are uh, considered the future food. Uh, but among uh, novel foods uh, that are foods not consumed in a significant way before May 1997, despite uh, historically uh, entomophagy has not been practiced in Europe uh, mainly for social and uh, cultural issues, nowadays the taste of uh, insects uh, attracts more and more curiosity and European uh, Food Safety Authority has uh, recently declared the safety of uh, mealworm larvae, the Tenebrio molitor, and uh, banded crickets, the Gridido ECG. Uh, however, great attention must be paid uh, to their potential side effects, uh, such as allergenic reaction in the sensitized population, since uh, insects uh, are related to crustaceans that are very important allergenic sources. Uh, so, in silico assessment of allergenicity is becoming an alternative for allergen screening in new foods. FAO and World Health Organization have stabilized guidelines for the cross-reactivity determination between expressed proteins and known allergen using the comparison uh, of their uh, primary structure. Uh, Cross-reactivity happens if the IgIe um, identifies as analogs uh, proteins with similar allergenic determinants or epitopes. Uh, this process will occur when the identity percentage, the PID, is higher than 35% using a windows of uh, 18 amino acids, or when uh, there is an identity in six uh, continuous one. Uh, so identity represents the percentage of identical amino acids along the considered sequences, and uh, these slides, for example, reports the alignment between uh, one of the beta-casein epitopes uh, with two dummy sequences. 
Um, in both cases, we have 50% of identity, since 12 amino acids out of uh, 24 are identical in the aligned uh, sequences. However, the second peptide uh, has a sequence of eight consecutive identical amino acids and more likely gives uh, cross reactivity because of the second uh, FAO criterion. Today, several uh, databases of software collecting information on allergenic proteins uh, or that allow for similarity searches between uh, studied proteins and known allergens are available. And the uh, first file of uh, those allergens uh, that have their codes, the tails, and amino acid sequences expressed using single letter codes are uh, available uh, in uh, appropriate databases such as uh, Uniprot or uh, NCBI. Um, Allergen.org, Allergome, uh, Compare, and and uh, allergen online are the most used database uh, updated uh, at least annually of uh, allergenic proteins. And uh, the one that is uh, um, uh, quietly common use uh, is allergen online that uh, allows for searching for potentiality allergenic for potential allergenic proteins uh, by loading uh, also hundreds of uh, FASTA sequences uh, also simultaneously using the full FASTA uh, comparison method. Um, in, this in, this in this way, alignment, identity, and statistical expectation score, the E-score, are uh, evaluated on the whole proteins. The E-score uh, represents the probability of a uh, by chance uh, alignment and often very low scores and high identities reflect a uh, high possibility of cross reactivity. Obviously, the agar is the um, PID, the agar is the possibility of cross reactivity. On the other hand, uh, results are not easy to handle, being a PDF file containing hundreds of uh, pages, so it's not easy to manage these uh, results. So, recently, we have decided to develop our uh, software for simplifying the entire uh, pipeline for allergen identification. In Food, uh, alert that is allergen identification, is a set of MATLAB functions that allow for uh, potential allergens identification in uh, for novel food following uh, high output analysis. It compensates for allergen online defects uh, to using a similar approach uh, that is uh, applicable to results of uh, proteomic analysis software, uh, which generally uh, returns uh, hundreds of proteins from uh, analysis of a single sample. And uh, the first step was uh, the creation of the alert database. We have downloaded and combined the protein sequences included in the previously mentioned sites, eliminating uh, redundancy and uh, preserving the information of each one. The user can apply one of the databases, for example, Allergen Online 1 that has uh, 2,000 proteins, or better, the union of the four that has uh, more than 5,000 uh, unique amino acid uh, sequences. And uh, Alert works uh, regardless the user of proteomic approach, top down or bottom up. We use a bottom up approach and uh, uh, we use different extraction methods. Um, software inputs are proteins identification codes that are obtained by using, uh, in our case, pro uh, thermoproteome discovery and software. Uh, then uh, FASTA sequences are obtained. And uh, the main LRT advantage lies in the simplicity of research interpretation, because in an Excel file, proteins are listed in four sheets according to the evidence of allergenicity. So no allergens and proteins with different probability of uh, cross reactivity according to their uh, PID. In uh, divided in uh, three um, uh, in uh, uh, three sheets. Uh, when dealing uh, with the pearly study matrices, as you know, um, such as insect, uh, comparison of extraction method is uh, mandatory to try to obtain the highest number of proteins. And for the reason, for this reason, for extraction method were implied and uh, compared for the for the identification of allergenic proteins, both in uh, sigillatus and uh, tenebrio model. Uh, extraction procedure are resumed and labeled uh, with uh, P1, P2, P3, and P4. Uh, samples uh, were uh, bought from a French website and were uh, all dehydrated uh, mealworms, so the Tenebrio monitor, and uh, banded crickets, uh, the Grillides sigillatus, um, exclusively fed with uh, organic ingredients. And in the label, uh, there's words that uh, this, those products uh, may contain similar allergens to shellfish. 
Uh, as a first step of this study, a bottom-up uh, protein approach was used uh, and uh, protein triptych digests were analyzed by RTLC, ESI, FTMS, MS uh, uh, analysis in uh, conducted in positive ion mode, uh, working in data-dependent data dependent, uh, in data dependent, uh, mode. And uh, the results raw files were used as an input of a protein discovery processing method. Uh, here you can see an obtained uh, chromatogram for an embryo molitor, and uh, um, there's wrote the, um, in this article there's uh, everything about this uh, chromatogram. Um, as a database for protein identification, we have used uh, the one obtaining, uh, uh, obtained combining um, uh, genomic information, uh, Swiss prot. Uh, um, verified uh, species the Amphilum database. And uh, uh, as you can see, the extraction procedure P4 seems to be the better in terms of uh, identified proteins. But we want to outline that uh, to try to find more putative allergens in those matrices, so we have uh, um, used combined results obtained from the four extraction uh, procedure. And uh, among uh, from the proteins, uh, only the one with a coverage higher than 10% were used for further analysis, and a great number of protein was excluded also because those samples contain very, very large proteins, and it's not easy to obtain high coverages in this condition. Similar results were obtained working on the CG lattice and the cricket sample with a lower number of identified proteins, but really similar results. Uh, here uh, in this slide, uh, LFT research results are shown, uh, and searching for putative allergens in uh, Tenebrio Monitor. Um, Tenebrio Monitor is, the, is just this, is the larval form of uh, Melbourne beetle. Um, we obtained the uh, interesting uh, uh, findings uh, um, because three known allergens were found, all related, all related to tropomyosin. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, the tropomyosin of uh, Tenebrio that uh, recently was declared uh, as an allergen and uh, added to allergen online, but not uh, to the other databases. Um, it was added to allergen online database only in the last version. Uh, well, the other two are uh, present in allergom database and are uh, tropomyosin from uh, silk worm. Tropomyosin is a quite common allergen in crustacea and synthesis population could have uh, prostactivity as reported in the product label. And uh, additionally, 10 proteins with uh, identity higher than 70% with known allergens were found, so with very high um, possibility of cross-reactivity. And uh, among them, uh, the first one, according to the e-score, is a protein uh, similar to that of a uh, fever mosquito that has not similarity with the uh, crustacea allergenic one. Um, so um, uh, uh, great attention must be paid. And uh, the second research is uh, related, for example, to um, different form of uh, troponin C, a quite common allergen of insects, uh, was allergenicity is normally airway mediated and uh, related to dust, but uh, uh, attention must be paid uh, uh, to those proteins, uh, um, especially when uh, uh, insect will be widely used as uh, food, because we can uh, uh, probably find that uh, those are also food allergens. And uh, furthermore, uh, other tenebrio proteins with uh, PID higher than 50% and 35% so more than uh, 500 known allergens were found. Um, and similarly, those are results obtained for uh, sigillatus uh, extracts. Um, four known allergenic proteins uh, were found, uh, and all are related to uh, insects uh, tropomyosins. Uh, word of note uh, is the presence uh, of a putative allergen with uh, PID higher than 50%, with, with strong evidence of allergenicity, with a cytochrome C of a fungal allergen, um, who was uh, allergen is uh, also in this case uh, airway mediated, and uh, also in this case it's not related to crustaceans. So uh, great attention must be paid to possible cross reactivity, especially for people not allergic to shellfishes uh, that could understand estimated uh, risks, obviously. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, um, by using LFT and uh, bottom-up approach, 
We have found uh, putative allergenic proteins in uh, both uh, edible insect samples. Um, uh, as you have seen, uh, um, protein extraction is a critical step in allergen identification procedure, and uh, um, more studies are necessary to clarify allergenic risk in, in edible insects, uh, such as in vivo evaluation uh, with set of putative uh, um, suggested allergens. Uh, and uh, alert is coming soon, we hope. And uh, uh, I want to thank, uh, uh, first of all, the scientific committee for this uh, opportunity. My research group from Bari, so Professor, uh, Professor Essa Calvano, Professor Cataldi, Professor Losito, and all the PhD students, and uh, the print that uh, financed this uh, research. Uh, obviously, all of you for the attention. Thank you. So thank you, Giovanni. Let's see if someone has some questions or curiosity. I don't see any raised the hands. So, okay, thank you again, Giovanni. And we can go to the next speaker, Simona Ranallo from University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Hi. Hi. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh... Yes. And Simona is presenting Electrochemical DNA based platform for the multiplex detection of clinically relevant antibodies. Okay. Perfect. Okay. We can Perfect. see. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Nuncia, for the introduction. And I want to thank the organizing committee to let me spread here some of the results obtaining during my Marie Curie Fellowship and especially regarding this project that uh, involves the development of electrochemical DNA-based platform for antibody detection. Uh, it's already, what's going on? Okay, it's already well known and then it's been extremely underlined during the last couple of years with COVID-19, how antibody represent one of the most interesting and important biological marker for a wide range of diseases from autoimmune disease to uh, cancer. And so it's been extremely underlined even for oncology. So antibody-based molecular recognition play a crucial role for a wide range of applications ranging from diagnostic, molecular imaging, Antibody-based therapy for immunotherapy on oncology has been extremely exploited in the last five, six years and targeted drug delivery. So nowadays, antibody-based tests are mostly commonly used are uh, based on lateral flow technology or enzyme-linked immunosorbent say that are pretty much converts on laboratory processes. So on one hand, the first one are very easy to use at a low cost, but they suffer because they are just qualitative. On the second hand, the ELISA test or uh, Western blots and many others are very sensitive and quantitative. So they allow a quantification of the antibodies, but they require the, uh, equipment, they are laboratory bound processes and they are multi steps. So this is going to put all these characteristics to this test very far away from the point of care testing. So to try to overcome this limitation, we and others in the last year are putting a lot of effort in a way to develop a sensitive and pretty rapid sensing test. So, but how to do it? So we actually work in the field of DNA now technology. So we are trying to exploiting the well-known characteristic of DNA as a building block material for this platform. By why we choose DNA? So actually, in my opinion, DNA is one of the most interesting and versatile material. First of all, it's very uh, easy to synthesize. It's a low cost and very important for us is uh, on one end to, to be able to predict the secondary structure that DNA can allow in solution on the, or on the surface. And secondly, we can attach a wide range of molecules to it, ranging from small molecules, peptide, readout molecules, such as electrochemical tags or optical tags. So uh, what we try to do, our goal in this project was to try to couple the advantages of this material, this new and exciting versatile material with the one offered by the electrochemical detection, all for the, de for the development of an electrochemical based platform that can be of utility in some analytical application. 
So, but let's see how we start. We decide to exploit the well-known uh, DNA-based reaction that is named to all mediated strand displacement. This is a pretty simple reaction in which we have a preformed duplex complex. So it's a complex made by two DNA strands hybridized one each other. And then we have a third strand that is designed to bind and displace one of the two strands involved in the duplex complex. So this third strand can be considered as a functional input. Only in the presence of this strand, we achieve the activation of the reaction that allowing the release of the strand. So this is the main principle of our platform. But as we said, we want to detect antibody. So we have to find a way to introduce the antibody in this kind of circuits. How we did it? We actually took this functional input and we, uh, and we split it in two different inputs. First of all, each of these inputs were modified with an antigen that will be recognized by a specific antibody, but the design was instrumental in this kind of system. So we took the functional input and we divided in two portions by making the orange portion over here with a complementary sequence. But these two strands are designed in a way that uh, in the absence of the target antibody, those affinities pretty low. So these two strands are no hybridizes one to each other. But when the antibody is present, it's going to bind the two recognition elements over here and uh, it's going to confine the two strands in a very low volume, increasing the local concentration. Those allow the reconstitution of the functional input that will be able to start the strand displacement reaction that allowing the release of the reported strand. We call this strand as reported strand because we want to make an electrochemical platform. So what we actually did is to employ a redox tag on the DNA strand that we release upon the presence of the specific antibody. So all these DNA-based circuits with the sample that we want to analyze can be combined and mixed in a very low volume, 100 microliter in a half and earth tube. And then we took a drop of this sample and then we move on the surface of a disposable electrode. We prepare a set of disposable electrodes by mobilizing, by creating a self-assembled monolayer, how it's called, by mobilizing a capture probe over here that is designed to be complementary to the strand that is released in the presence of the target antibody. So actually we achieve a current peak just in the presence of the specific antibody because the reported strand hybridizing to the capture one on the electric surface is going to put the methyl and blue very close by the surface of the electrode allow the electron transfer between it. So as first proof, proof of principle, we develop a sensor for the detection of anti in antibodies. This is not a clinically relevant antibody, but the conjugation of the apt and the small molecules digoxygenine to DNA strand is pretty easy at a very low cost. So for the principle I've just explained to you, we demonstrate that we achieve an increase of the current peak in the presence of the antibody that can be actually quantified. We achieve a low nanomolar detection limit for the sensor and uh, even more important because we want to use this sensor for like real samples. So this means that in the samples, we don't have just the specific antibody that we want to quantify, but well, we have a bench of different antibody in clinical samples. So the platform is really specific and we don't observe any current signal, even at saturating concentration of no specific antibodies. So the design principle and uh, what allow us about DNA nanotechnology to change the recognition element in this case or the molecules employed in our system make our platform really versatile. We demonstrate this by changing the recognition element by employing in this case a small molecules dinitrophenol and we achieve in the detection of anti-dinitrophenol antibody comparable result to the anti-dig platform in terms of efficiency, sensitivity and specificity. Because most of the clinically relevant antibody recognize proteins, so actually peptide that are present in the proteins, we designed to adapt this platform to a modular version. Uh, it's actually the same principle. So we kept the, the two input strand over here, but instead of having a modification of the antigen at one end, we used uh, a sequences here in purple that is going to act as anchoring strand for the introduction in this case of the specific peptide that will be recognized by the clinical relevant antibodies. So we introduced the peptide by using a sequence of PNA instead of DNA. PNA is a DNA analog, analog 
but we just decide to use PNA instead of DNA because the conjugation of a peptide to the PNA strand is much easier at a low cost instead of the DNA ones. So we, we create this modular platform and we demonstrate the detection uh, of uh, three clinically relevant antibody. First of all, the Shetuximab. This is a monoclonal antibody used for the treatment of several types of cancer. Then we detect anti-HIV and anti-HA antibodies that are diagnostic for the HIV and for the influenza A, respectively. All the three sensor platforms respond with the sensitivity, specificity, and efficiency comparable to the non-modular content part. We also demonstrate that we are able to orthogonally and simultaneously detect different antibody in the same sample solution. To do that, we modified our platform by mobilizing on the, sen on the sensor two different capture probes. One that is able to detect the released strand from the DNA circuits that detect and quantify the cetuximab. And the other one, for the anti-dig antibody. Of course, because we are making like electrochemical measurement, we, doesn't we don't want that uh, to have like overlapping peak because we want to be sure to be able to quantify both the antibody in the same sample solution. So we mix in the same solution, both the DNA circuits, and then we took a drop and we moved to onto the electrode surface. By challenging with various combination of antibodies, this sensor, we actually can see that we observe the specific peak related to the redox tag of each circuits just in presence of the specific target antibody. And both peak of the same voltammogram can be achieved just when simultaneously the two antibodies are present in the same sample solution. So we have demonstrated with this work the development of a very sensitive uh, DNA-based platform for antibody detection. This platform is, is really versatile and can be applied for the detection of any antibody for which an antigen can be conjugated to a DNA strand. All the reaction can be made in a very low volume and at a very low cost because we just employ DNA sequences that are, as well as I say at the beginning, it's a very low cost material. So all these characteristics we believe that makes our platform uh, suitable for home tests and in the field of point of care diagnostic. We are also thinking of uh, adapting the readout of our reaction. So to make this quantification of for the home tests by having uh, how to put by uh, using a smartphone. So uh, I'd like to thank for all this work, first of all, the European Commission that believes in that project and, and found my Marie Curie Fellowship. I want to thank Professor Francesco Ricci from University of Rome Tor Vergata and Professor Kevin Plasco from the University of California, Santa Barbara, that is hosting me for my outgoing phase. A special thanks is to Sara Bracaglia, his PhD student in the Laboratory of Analytical Chemistry of University of Rome Tor Vergata that worked very hard on these projects, all my research group, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona, and congratulations you. on your work. Let's see if someone has some curiosity or questions. Uh, Simona, I, I have a question for you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, nice presentation, for your very I level work and uh, I, I have one question about the, the detection limit of your of your methods and if you think that uh, if there is any any particular difference among this approach and the fluorescence based approach that you and your group already developed in the previous work. Uh, thank you, Stefano, for the question. So actually, the detection limit that we reach here is about, as I said, is in the low nanomolar range. So and we estimate that it's about between five and nine nanomolar uh, concentrations. So for example, for the cetuximab that, uh, as I said, is well exploited for like uh, oncology treatment, uh, the dosage that uh, the, um, the, the doctor is going to give to the patients is like uh, one fold over what we can detect. So we know that we can use that for this kind of treatment. And regarding the second part of the question about the optical sensor, uh, 
pretty much at, at, at this moment for this work, the detection limit that we got is similar, but of course, in this case, we have some, some advantages made by the electrochemical stuff. But regarding this, we are just uh, working right now and uh, uh, on the kind of amplification step by using cell-free system for the detection of these antibodies is going to allow us to go in the picomolar range for the detection of these clinically relevant antibodies. Thank you very much, Simona. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all the speakers of this session. Now we are going to do a little break. So we will see you again at 11.20. So just 10 minutes for a little coffee break for all of us. Thank you again.
welcome back. Welcome back to how do meaning for young chemists in the biomedical sciences. So after the, the first session of the of the morning, we are ready to start with the uh, with the second with the second uh, groups of uh, oral presentation. And now is the turn of uh, Susi Piovesana from the University of Rome uh, Sapienza. So Hi, Susie. Okay. So when, when you're you ready, you can uh, share your presentation and uh, start with your presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I hope you can hear and see me well. Yes, yes. Okay, very well. So before starting, I'd like to thank uh, for the kind introduction and the possibility to present my, uh, my results uh, in uh, this specific topic. So, uh, okay, condividi schermata, okay. Okay, you should see the presentation now. Yes. So I will tell, I will talk uh, to you about uh, uh, our results in the field of uh, the analysis of sulfated peptides. And this specific topic is actually um, very important and is part of a, a much wider framework, which is the one of the study of protein post-translational modifications. Uh, PTMs, as they are commonly called, are actually very important because they affect uh, protein function and in turn uh, cell activities. They are responsible for the uh, increased complexity of proteins than genomes and there are uh, more than 300 known modifications. However, if we have a look to uh, how many of them are actually studied by proteomics, we will be surprised because only uh, very few of them are actually studied. This is a, a table summarizing the uh, occurrence of the main modifications in the Swiss Prot database uh, dating back to uh, 2020. And we can see that the most represented modification is actually phosphorylation with uh, 58,000 sites. This is a very large number and it reflects uh, the availability of analytical methods, uh, even uh, automated one, ones for the analysis of phosphorylated peptides. When I tell about this, I mean uh, that there are methods for the enrichment of phosphorylated peptides, fractionation of complex mixtures, analysis of sequences and site localization. If we go down uh, uh, along this uh, list, uh, we see that numbers uh, start to drop because uh, uh, modifications in this case uh, are still quite uh, studied. For instance, glycosylation is a very hot topic, but at the same time, we have also open challenges, uh, which is reflected in the lower frequency of these modifications. So if we finally reach uh, uh, the, uh, the modification of interest for today, which is a fashion, which we see that there are only uh, 500 uh, reported sites. Uh, this number is quite surprising because uh, sulfation uh, is uh, the most common modification for tyrosine. It is also very important as it regulates protein-protein uh, interactions uh, and cell-cell interactions, uh, um, especially in extracellular medium and uh, in uh, membranes. But uh, in this specific case, uh, uh, we are um, in a difficult situation from the analytical uh, point of view because there are very limited methods uh, for analysis of sulfated peptides. So this is a summary of the literature and uh, we uh, see here the methods which have been described for the enrichment of sulfated peptides without the derivatization. It's actually very few of them, only two, which are um, affinity chromatography to gallium and antibodies were used for, com for uh, complex samples. All the others were just tested on uh, pure standards and include weak anion exchange sorbents and molecularly imprinted uh, polymers. So why is it so difficult to analyze a modification which is actually very uh, close to phosphorylation? Why can't we use, for instance, the methods developed for the analysis of uh, phosphorylated peptides? 
Well, actually, the, the answer to these questions uh, is uh, connected uh, with the uh, different chemical behavior uh, of sulfation and in particular to uh, the liability of uh, the sulfate group to the acid hydrolysis. So uh, the direct extension of uh, methods already developed for phosphorylation is uh, not possible and uh, uh, the common strategies used for sequences are also not applicable. The labile nature of sulfation actually uh, also affects another important step uh, in proteomics analysis, uh, which is a pillar uh, for uh, assessing peptide sequence and structure. And uh, uh, I'm referring to mass spectrometry. In this specific case, uh, it is very common for sulfate moieties to uh, uh, provide uh, um, neutral loss of sulfur trioxide and this can occur in source during ionization so we completely lose any information about the peptide being modified or it can occur during uh, fragmentation so we don't have information on the site of the modification. Uh, this entire picture, which is, uh, which is uh, already uh, quite complicated actually, is uh, further uh, complicated by the, um, the fact that sulfation and phosphorylation are very close uh, in terms of mass shift. So uh, they are nearly isobaric and uh, uh, this requires very high resolution uh, to differentiate them and it's also not always applicable. So in this context, uh, we tried to develop uh, a method for the enrichment of sulfated peptides, which is the first problem. And uh, in particular, uh, to achieve this goal, we selected two uh, standards, which are commercially available, of uh, natural sulfated peptides, uh, representative for uh, sulfates, uh, peptides having one single sulfated tyrosine and two sulfated tyrosines. And these uh, standards were used for recovery studies. So uh, we uh, analyzed them by UHPLC coupled to, high resol to mm, low resolution mass spectrometry with uh, triple quadruple detection. And uh, uh, we could assess the recovery of the standards using five different uh, type of materials and procedures. So they are summarized in the yellow box and uh, they the stationary phases were chosen based on the literature, so we see two weak anion exchange sorbents, and, uh, and then they were, so, they were also chosen based on our experience with the phosphorylated peptides, so we see an iron IMAC resin and a titanium di dioxide spin columns. These four materials are commercially available and uh, easy to use. The fourth material with which we selected was a titanium uh, IMAC material, and uh, this was uh, developed in our laboratories and uh, can enrich phosphorylations uh, at mild acidic conditions. So we thought it's suitable. However, if we have a look uh, to the results uh, summarized in this graph, we can see that uh, regardless of the type of the protocol, titanium was never effective in enriching the sulfated peptides. Uh, whereas good results were obtained with uh, uh, the other solvents. In particular, uh, two of them were uh, quite uh, satisfactory. So one uh, weak anion exchange solvent, the strata one, and uh, the iron IMAC resin. So they were further uh, studied. This time we changed the type of sample uh, using a a sample uh, constituted by BSA digests, so bovine serum albumin protein digests, spiked with the sulfated standards. Mm, this approach is actually quite common and is used to mimic uh, the complexity of a cell uh, extracts and digest. Uh, from the results, uh, we can see that the two sorbents uh, at different concentrations actually uh, worked pretty well and were practically identical in performance in terms of recovery and matrix effect. But our final choice uh, was for the iron IMAC material because uh, it has uh, much more selectivity. In this case, the selectivity was calculated uh, using uh, shotgun proteomics, so nano HPLC coupled to high resolution mass spectrometry and database search to identify the uh, peptides which were co-enriched with the sulfated standards. So we see here the results. The iron IMAC material was uh, um, four times more selective than the other one. So uh, 
this uh, iron material was uh, embedded uh, in a possible workflow for sulfated peptide analysis. Uh, here we see a summary of this uh, workflow which we devised. In this case, the uh, uh, sample was further uh, complicated than uh, the original one. So we have serum, which is uh, very complex. It was spiked with the sulfated standards at low concentration range, and the entire mixture was uh, subjected to dephosphorylation. This step is also very important, it's not common in uh, shotgun proteomics, but in this case it's fundamental because we can in this way eliminate the uh, phosphorylations in the sample with very high selectivity using alkaline phosphatase, which is an enzyme. And uh, by doing this, we also eliminate uh, the competition to the iron uh, uh, IMAC resin during enrichment and at the bottom of the workflow uh, for the identification of MSM mass spectra. So after this step, proteins were digested with trypsin, which is uh, uh, very common in uh, proteomics, and the resulting mixture was enriched with the iron IMAC resin following the manufacturer's protocol, so nothing uh, uh, really complicated. The recovery of the entire procedure was 20%, which may appear low, but actually is, uh, is more than satisfactory because it's completely compatible with similar studies on protein phosphorylations. However, we were disappointed when trying to identify the uh, sulfur peptides possibly enriched in this procedure using proteomics and different uh, bioinformatic solutions because we could find none. So we realized that the uh, MSMS detection is actually very critical in this step. So we're moving further to study the MS behavior of sulfated peptides within the EPIX project uh, in collaboration with a group of Professor Hack uh, of Utrecht University. We are studying this MS behavior using uh, triptych peptides. So here we see the sequences. They are natural peptides from bovine fibrinogen, and we synthesized them both as native sulfated uh, peptides and phosphorylated counterparts to, to compare them. From this comparison, we see that uh, in the ionization process in positive uh, uh, ionization mode, uh, actually, of course, phosphorylated peptides don't have any problems, whereas the sulfated ones uh, do display uh, some degree of uh, uh, sulfur trioxide in source loss. And this is particularly uh, critical for lower charge states uh, than for higher ones. Um, this phenomenon, however, is typical, so it can be used to differentiate the two types of peptides. And uh, moving further to the fragmentation, we see this uh, phenomenon actually can happen again. Uh, during HCID, we see that the main pathway for sulfated peptides is the loss of sulfur trioxide. And only after this is complete at high energies, the peptide backbone starts uh, to fragment, uh, producing a spectrum which is identical to that of uh, an unmodified peptide. So again, the, we have a, a typical behavior of sulfated peptides, which is not uh, uh, observed for the phosphorylated one and can help us distinguish it from the unmodified one. In this situation, we also thought of moving to different techniques. In particular, uh, we thought of using negative ion ionization. This is not typical in uh, proteomics. However, it could be a solution in this specific application. Here we see the full scan of the uh, phosphorylated and sulfated peptides in negative ion ionization. We can see now that the uh, in-source fragmentation is uh, completely suppressed also for the sulfated peptides. So we have intact uh, precursors with clear signals and uh, we can proceed to fragment them. Here we see uh, the fragmentation spectra of the phosphorylated peptides and the sulfated one. And we see also okay, the, um, the possibility of a uh, seen uh, typical ions uh, in the case of phosphorylated peptides, which are very diagnostic. So, so this ion, which is at low, uh, um, low masses, so it's uh, not usually um, recorded, but in this case, it's important, uh, is the final evidence uh, which helps us distinguish the phosphorylated and the sulfated peptides, as we have no similar ion for the sulfated one. 
So the issue of site location is still ongoing and we are working on this. And uh, I'm finished my presentation. Uh, before closing, I want to thank everyone who worked in the project in uh, the research group where I work and also outside. And I want to thank you for your kind, for your kind attention. Thank you, Susie, for your presentation. And uh, just a quick question. Well, yeah. what, what do you think to, to, go, to, to address this issue? in the future study, what is, what is your plan? Site location, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, okay. I've not said it because, well, I had to cut and also I'm still studying the spectra, but we are using different types of fragmentations. So uh, other fragmentation techniques and uh, the use of metal cations adducts uh, could be a possible solution because uh, um, we have spectra where there is a tiny amount of product ions of the sulfated peptides still bearing the modification. So in that case, uh, we say the problem is pretty solved because uh, we have uh, both the information. So we can distinguish the sulfated peptide from a phosphorylated one from a peptide without any modification. And we can also provide the, uh, the final uh, answer to where the modification is set. So perhaps next year you're going to show us the, the solution of your- I map. hope so, I hope so. I would be glad. Even before, yeah, I hope for you. So thank you very much I for hope. your presentation. Thank you, thank Susie. You. So we have now the next speaker that is Jerro Saidi Khan from the University of West of England from Bristol, UK. Jerro, are you here? Yes. Okay. So we, we cannot, we cannot hear you. We cannot see you. You can activate your voice. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yeah, but we don't see you. So you should activate your camera if it's possible. Okay. If not, you can keep going with this. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out where to on you know. On the bottom left, bottom left should be some some button. Are you Hello. are you seeing me now? We we are hearing you, you but. We don't see you, but in any case, you can just share your presentation, Jero. Wow, uh, anyway, I'm trying to figure out how to see my video. Uh, but anyway, that's taking a little bit long time. Yes, um, okay. Don't worry, so the stage is your, Jero. Um, sorry. Wow. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jero Sedik, I'm a PhD researcher at the University of West of England. Um, uh, I'm going to see with you uh, my recent work on the paper based device for, for coagulation analysis. And then the topic today I wish to see with you is paper based device for measuring fibrinogen in human plasma. Uh, I must say I'm very much glad to be part of this. And then uh, I wish to thank the organizers of this uh, program and then for giving me the opportunity to, to share my work with you. Uh, this is how I intend to uh, you know, uh, uh, present the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the topic. Um, it's break down into different, different sections. So first of all, we start with the introduction to put things into perspective. So fibrinogen is a, is a 340 KDA plasma protein that circulates in blood at two to four milligrams per mil. It is an essential coagulation factor, which is converted into monomers polymerized to form fibrin clot, which sealed wounds and stop bleeding. 
This concentration in plasma is a risk factor for bleeding and clotting disorders. Clotting and bleeding disorders are very common in low income regions. Fast and reliable determination of this fibrinogen blood is therefore crucial for diagnosing clotting and bleeding problems. The current uh, diagnostic tests are either expensive, lab based, or require technical expertise, which are often lacking in, in low resource environments. Paper based analytical devices are attractive for their low cost, sustainability, simplicity, and therefore they, they appear to be ideal for use in low resource environment. In this work, Paper-based um, uh, paper lateral device for sustainable measurement of fibrinogen in plasma, human plasma, have been developed. Uh, this is the device fabrication methods. Uh, we use uh, Microsoft PowerPoint to design the shape of the strips and then use wax printing to, to print the shapes on, on the substrate, which is a chromatography paper, after which it is then cured in an oven at 100 degrees Celsius for about two minutes to allow the wax to sink into the paper. And then after this thrombin, bovine thrombin is then immobilized on the surface of these uh, paper strips, after which it is dried and then cut into pieces. And then the pieces are then inserted into a plastic holder, which is 3D printed. Operational principle of this device is based on clothing and viscosity dynamics coupled with lateral flow technology. When the sample is applied on the strip, it will, you know, the thrombin in the in the strip will will trigger clothing, which will convert the the sample into a gel and eventually stop it from flowing. The fibrinogen content is directly related to clothing rate, but it is inversely related to to the distance that is covered by the sample. Longer distances of the sample on the strips shows uh, low fibrinogen, while shorter distances show high, uh, uh, high fibrinogen content. Yeah, coagulation and sample flow rate. Uh, in order to isolate the effect of coagulation on sample flow rate, different fluids were run on the modified as well as unmodified test strips. Uh, as you can see in the first one, we modify the strip with just a buffer, so therefore there is no clothing. Uh, you can see different fluids tend to flow at different rates simply because of their viscosity differences. You see that water flows faster than serum and then plasma. Plasma is much more viscous, so therefore it flows more slowly. But then thrombin modified strips shows a different, a slightly different kind. In both cases, you can see that. Uh, in all the different fluid, they, they tend to flow slowly on, on thrombin modified strips, which could mean that thrombin actually tend to inhibit the flow of all of the fluid, you know, in addition to, in addition to the effect of coagulation. If you look at the difference between the gap, uh, the, the, the gap, uh, yeah, the difference between the distance covered by plasma and serum, and compared with the fourth one, where the strips are uh, modified with the just buffer, you'll see that the gap become wider when thrombin is is immobilized on the on the surface of the strips, which could mean that there is an additional inhibition to the flow of the plasma, which could be you know attributed to coagulation. So in the in the in the in the third graph, you can see that uh, uh, different strips have been you know, uh, modified with one one set is modified with buffer and the other one is modified with thrombin. And then plasma, which actually contain the coagulation factors are run on that. So you see the buffer coated one tend to flow faster and cover a longer distance, while the thrombin coated one cover a shorter distance. Also seeing the contribution of coagulation in reducing the flow rate and hence the distance covered. Um, here fibrinogen content and sample travel distances you know, which is the main thing, you know, that could be used to determine fibrinogen here. So here we, we are just trying to play around to see how different flow rate and different distances could be used to determine uh, fibrinogen level. So different concentrations of fibrinogen were run on thrombin modified strips. But then these are thrombin was applied at different concentrations and also at different, different uh, um, positions along the strips. In the first one, you see 50, 50 uh, units per meal of thrombin was applied at the middle of the 
of the strip and then when the samples were run we got uh, we got uh, a slope of about minus two which indicates sensitivity and a correlation of 0 .0, 0 0.9 something but then when this when the thrombin was applied in the middle but with a lower concentration of 20 units per mil we we we, we realized an increased sensitivity minus four instead of minus two and then the when it was applied at the sample application zone, we see even a greater sensitivity of minus six. So it was decided that applying thrombin at the sample application zone is the best one. And then these are uh, actually these different graphs shows how the content of fibrinogen relate to distance travel. So we also found that thrombin, the amount, the activity of thrombin applied on these strips also have an effect on the sample flow rate as well as the distance covered. So which could also mean that normal plasma apply on the strip, the distance covered could be used to indicate the activity of thrombin, which is mobilized on the, on the strips. Optimization of the device. The agent optimization was done, uh, optimization was done using different parameters. Some uh, re, uh, using the reagent parameter, like the concentration of the reagent, which is thrombin, as well as sample volume. So for the reagent optimization, we use different concentrations of, of thrombin, 20, 30, and 40. And then we were looking at the performance based on the slope, the correlation coefficient, as well as the precision. So as you can see in this table, the first one, 30 units per mil appear to give the best combination of sensitivity, correlation, and the precision. So 30, micro, uh, 30 unit per mil was used. And then sample volume optimization, 20, 22, 24, and 26 microliters of this of plasma samples were investigated. And as you can see from there, the slope, uh, the best uh, combination of slope, uh, correlation, and uh, precision happened to be given by 22 microliters. And then uh, calibration curve of the optimized device, you know, shows. So the, 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 the relationship between distance covered, which is Y, and, uh, and the concentration of, uh, uh, of, uh, of fibrinogen in the, in the samples, which is X. So it is not linear. It is like curve, inverse curve linear kind of relationship. We, and we thought the best one is a logarithmic you know, kind of curve. Uh, validation, to validate these 20 samples, you know, and three, uh, three replicates were run on the device as well as on, on an established um, routine, uh, routine method, which we use a Umizen G200 analyzer to test these samples and then compare them. So um, we compare them to show the, to, to show the correlation between the, the test strip that we have uh, prepared and then the well established routine method, which is the Umizen G200 analyzer. We saw a, a strong correlation between them, which you can see R square equals to 0 0.9. And then the, um, the equation also you know, tend to pass through very close to zero. And then, uh, yeah, so it shows that there is a strong correlation between them. Then we also run a blunt atman plot to see how much the, the test result from the test sample, uh, from the test strips, and that of the well established um, routine method, how much agreement have been, um, have been achieved? We've seen that there is a strong agreement between them. You know, all the data points uh, happen to lie between the lower uh, limit, of, uh, limit of agreement and that of the upper limit of agreement. So all the data point, you know, we know lies within that particular gap, not as even a single data point was uh, well, like outside. So which also shows a strong agreement between our method, our test method, and, uh, and the well-established uh, routine method. So device stability, we tested the stability or the functional life of the device over a one month period. So the first day we, the, we, we we prepare all the devices and then store them in different conditions, test them that particular day, and then put them in different bodies and then store them at different conditions. You can see at the freezer, in a freezer, in a fridge, at ambient temperature, and also at elevated temperature. 
we found that in the freezer and the in the freezer and the fridge, the device remains stable for about three weeks. After which, the enzyme or probably something else tend to change, and then they appear to deviate from the normal range of uh, of, of the distance that is supposed to be read by normal plasma. And for ambient temperature, the first week was okay, but then. Uh, yeah, the first week was okay, but then after that, it tend to go down, which uh, could possibly be attributed to hydro hydrophobicity of the device as it become drier and drier, not necessarily because of the active increased activity of the enzyme. In an oven, this one there is no, you know, no apparent explanation as to how it appears, because initially it was a little bit. Um, uh, it covers a longer distance, which necessarily does not mean enzymes are much more active. It could possibly be because it is much more hydrophobic. But then after another day, you know, after the first week, the second week, we see an increased distance. So, uh, and then in the last week, we saw, we saw a decreased one. So actually, it's a little bit difficult to figure out what actually is happening here. So it goes down and up. But we on, we already know that Elevated temperature and ambient temperature are not the right ways of uh, of, uh, of storing these devices. So the best way to divide, to, to store them uh, in the freezer and in the fridge, and they can stay in those conditions for about three weeks. Um, um, this work is possible because of the contribution of, let's say, first of all, UK Commonwealth Scholarship, which is a uh, actually sponsoring the, a, a, wider, a wider project in which this particular work is part of. And then I must uh, also acknowledge the, the, the support of the uh, support of Professor Tony, Tony Kilat, which is the lead supervisor of this project, and uh, Dr. Jennifer May, which is a co-supervisor of, uh, of this project. So I must say thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, especially the scientific group, I must say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to join this um, conference as well as uh, see uh, with you my work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you for your, your work. And I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, because, because you, um, you quantify the, the, the distance of the liquid, of the in presence of fibrinogen. So, yes. is the temperature uh, an important uh, feature to be con con considered or not? So, I mean, the evaporation of the of the sample uh, could affect the. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. The evaporation of the sample, uh, yeah, humidity level of the atmosphere, as well as temperature, could affect it. Especially when temperature goes beyond beyond forty degrees, that definitely affects the the flow rate. Because uh, uh, first of all, you know when temperatures reach, because we actually carried out some um, some tests, you know, you know, run at at elevated temperature at twenty five degrees, thirty degrees, thirty five degrees, and forty degrees. But then. Uh, at 40 degrees, we saw that there is a decreased activity of the enzymes, which means the, the, the distance covered by the sample goes even further. So which could mean that at a very high temperature, the enzymes are kind of inhibited or they are kind of denatured and it could definitely affect it. So therefore these are strips are not suitable for very high temperatures, for running them at very, very high temperatures, let's say above, above 37 degrees. So, and also at very low temperatures also, let's say less than 20 degrees, the enzyme activity also might be, might be, might be affected. They might be, they might not be very much active. So usually between 25 and 37 degrees, these devices will, will work very well. Okay. Thank you, Jero, for your presentation. Thank you for your work. And now it's time for the next speaker. So Jero, please remove your, your presentation, your sharing. And uh, now it's time for the last oral communication of this seventh session of the morning. Uh, after this, we will have the slide and talks format. So now is the, is the time for Federico Fanti from the University of Teramo. Federico. Good morning. Can you hear me? 
Well, we cannot we cannot see you, we cannot hear you. Okay, okay, there you go. Uh, I cannot hear you. Try now. Okay. Yes, so you can share your presentation. Yes, okay. When you want, you can start. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm to present my work about the analysis of short, um, short chain fatty acid by CMS and SNO. So, I want to introduce the, the compound. The short chain fatty acid is a, is a type of uh, molecules that produced from uh, gut microbiota during uh, uh, the digestion with the degradation transmutation reaction from uh, the carbohydrates. And uh, now this type of compound was linked to um, some diseases like uh, obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes. For example, and uh, now for, with uh, some other diseases uh, due to the theory of uh, the brain axis, uh, uh, the brain gut axis. So uh, the profile of uh, uh, organic acid in the fecal sample now it's uh, very common uh, to study the uh, gut microbiota uh, process if there is some alteration or. Uh, some uh, difficulty in the, in the growth. So um, the organic case usually was uh, uh, quantified with uh, gas chromatography and uh, liquid chromatography. But in the last year, the LCMS was an um, elective uh, technique for the quantification of, uh, of uh, organic acid. In uh, two type of uh, technique, in the normal phase uh, liquid chromatography and the reverse phase uh, liquid chromatography. The difference is that due to the variety, uh, normal phase uh, not need uh, the of the of the compound. Instead, the reverse phase liquid chromatography need a uh, dematization. Uh, the the, the classic derivatization usually uh, use this, uh, these two type of reagent, the ADC and the 3-MPH. This compound add the 3-MPH aromatic moiety to the carboxylic group of the organic acid. So this uh, gives uh, more retention in reverse phase chromatography, but uh, also more stability in the samples because the organic acid has, is known, uh, are known uh, as a very volatile molecules and tend to disappear in the sample over the time. But the derivatization process allow a great stability in the sample. In, uh, in our work in the literature, uh, it's test the stability of the organic, derivatized uh, organic acid in the sample, in the federal samples, in, uh, until the 90 days of the storage and uh, we can uh, see that uh, the, there is no degradation of the analysis during the time of storage. So the derivatization is a, a common uh, uh, procedure, not also for uh, the retention in the normal phase, but also for the study. Yeah, do that. So the uh, work is uh, the development of a uh, RMN scan uh, method for the quantification of the organic acid, but also using the uh, derivatization to uh, develop a precursor scan for screen method due to the high um, uh, differential profiling uh, in correlation with the type of disease. And of course, the development and validation of a clinical method to, uh, to cope with the precursor and uh, 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 method for increasing this. So, the, uh, the sample, the fused samples, uh, um, was extracted uh, by uh, anonymous analysis. 
uh, with uh, ceramic beads. And then uh, the sample was thrown uh, uh, in the SCA for the cleanup, uh, and then uh, analyzed by the CMS MS analysis. We uh, weighed uh, um, about uh, 500 milligram of uh, samples, and then uh, used the isopropanol for the extraction. We use the homogenizer because uh, only one step we can achieve the uh, homogenization of the sample and the extraction. We use three cycles of extraction uh, with 30 seconds of stop to quickly avoid uh, the increasing in temperature of the sample that uh, could be uh, lead to um, degradation of the analyte. So we perform a centrifugation to eliminate the, the residue of the sample uh, dilution, and then we perform the derivatization process. Uh, we bring uh, five microliter of diluted uh, sample and uh, add the internal standard to control the reaction. And uh, the two, rea and, uh, two rea uh, reagents for the derivatization. Then we use a thermomixer to control the, re the reaction and uh, for 30 minutes at 40 degrees. And, uh, and then we form the uh, acidification. Then we uh, bring the supernatant and uh, perform the SPA cleanup. We started to use two different types of, of uh, phase exterior of uh, phase, a uh, CAD that already used in some work in literature and a polymer phase. We see that with the CAD phase, uh, there is a poor uh, retention of the analyte also after the liberalization. Instead, with the polymeric phase, uh, we achieve a good retention at the increase uh, in function of the increasing of the percentage of water in the dwelling phase. Uh, then we test the dilution phase uh, in order to uh, obtain a good recovery, but also a good selectivity of the, uh, during the dilution. And we uh, achieve to um, optimize a, a, a protocol for the SP uh, extraction and cleanup. Using, and finally, the 80% of water for the loading step and the 80% uh, percent of uh, methanol for the emission. Then we developed the LCMS mass analysis method using a Nexera LC20 and a size to drop 4500 uh, using a CAD column with the 2.6 micrometer uh, uh, particle at a flow rate of 0 0.5 using forming acid in the phases to uh, increase the, uh, the retention of the analytes in the CAD phase. Then uh, we uh, start to test uh, the, the gradient uh, run and achieve a good separation of the analyte with using electrospray ionization in negative mode. Then we uh, optimize the parameter of MRN uh, through injection of the uh, target analyte in the, in the mass spectrometer. And we uh, observe that there is a common fragment, the 137.1 uh, uh, fragment, that is, uh, belong to the moiety of, uh, um, of TNPH derivation uh, during the derivation process. So we use this fragment to build a precursor ion scan to screen the presence of other derivatizated uh, organic acid in the sample that do not belong to, uh, to the list of MRN scan. Then we uh, validate the, the method in uh, test, uh, testing the recovery, matrix effect, limit of quantification, detection, accuracy, precision, carryover, and uh, linearity. 
the, the recovery is very, uh, we have we obtained a, a good recovery uh, from a higher than 70% and a lower matrix effect. Also, the accuracy and precision are in, uh, good uh, results and uh, low uh, LOQ and LOD uh, values. So we test uh, the method on a real samples uh, that belongs to a study in collaboration with Romatre that um, have the aims to find a correlation with the, the gut microbiota and the, the OECD uh, disease. In this case, we study in the first step uh, the target analyte. So, Acetic, probionic, butyric, and valeric acid. This is uh, um, the value from the control uh, mice uh, uh, samples. And then we reanalyze the sample uh, with the precursor and scan for the screening test to see if there is a other type of uh, organic acid that we can see in, during the MRM scan method. And we achieve two. They detect all the uh, organic acid in the MRM list, but also the carbonic acid, the two isomers of the carbonic acid that not belong to the MRM scan, that should be uh, interesting to analyze for uh, the, uh, the correlation with the OCD disease and gut microbiota. So, in conclusion, this work uh, we developed uh, and validate the LCMS MS quantification method uh, for uh, the organic acid. And in the same time, a precursor scan for the screening method of uh, the derivative SGFAs. And uh, as a future uh, perspective, uh, the method will be tested in other biological sample, samples, such as oral fluids and bacterial cultures for in vitro and vivo study. Thank you, Federico. Thank you for your presentation. I don't know if you, oh, no, sorry. You did, you did. And uh, I want uh, to thanks uh, to um, all the people involved in the project. And uh, of course, uh, thank you for your kind attention. Again, thank you, Federico, and sorry for, for this. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have, um, I, have, I have a curiosity. So you choose this kind of organic acid because they are the most important to give us some, some information, uh, some clinical information. And also, are this, um, this organic acid correlated among them or not? There is any correlation among the different levels, for example, of butyric acid and uh, acetic acid? Uh, the correlation is not uh, in the single organic acid, but in the uh, in the ratio of the organic acid during in the, in the, in the disease. So the profile of organic acid in the disease can be uh, changed, but uh, only the level uh, of single organic acid is not correlated with the disease, but all the profile or the ratio of the organic acid. Because it's dependent to the population of the gut microbiota. Okay, so if there are uh, if there are any questions, so okay, thank you, Federico. Thank you very much for presenting your work uh, to to this conference. So. It's not the, the share, of course. Yes, and share, please. Okay, so now let's move. Let's move to the slide and talk session. So we will have four speakers that will present their work with short presentation of five minutes each. So let's start with Vincenzo Mazzaracchio from University of Rome, Tor Vergata. Hi everybody, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you. First of all, I was uh, just want to thank the organization committee for inviting me uh, and giving me the opportunity to present my work today. So uh, today I'm going to present you. I'm going to show you a novel photoelectrochemical 
by a sensor um, for ethanol detection in uh, wine samples by using uh, mainly a screen printed uh, electrode uh, modified with uh, carbon black uh, with titanium dioxide nanocomposite and cocainon organic molecule. This modification was made in order to uh, mainly uh, enhance the photosensitization uh, of properties of the system. Uh, moreover, as we can see here, the sensor is uh, connected, uh, wire connected to a portable potentiostat. Uh, it is then connected to a laptop for data analysis. So why using these uh, modifiers? So first of all, the titanium dioxide is uh, mainly used in photoelectrochemical uh, applications thanks to its uh, important properties. It has a small band gap of 3.2 electron volts, a good chemical uh, stability, and uh, it is non-toxic. But it has some drawbacks, like for, first of all, the um, poor response in the visible range, uh, a fast recombination and uh, an excitation at 370 nanometers that is possible to be used when using our bio biomolecules. So for this reason, we use this uh, cocainon's uh, organic molecule that is a new class of quinoids compounds that is a cheap, very cheap raw materials and it allows for a visible region absorption at about 530 nanometers. Uh, giving it to the system a redshift, uh, um, yeah, uh, giving to the system a, a redshift. So uh, in our case, we also use this carbon black uh, that is uh, um, in this sensor, it was mainly used for, uh, for its properties. It has a high conductivity, high surface area, uh, and the presence of structural defects. So giving to the system uh, the possibility of a retardation of the electron hole the uh, pair recombination and uh, the, as well as the increasing of the surface area and absorption sites uh, of effective photocatalytic um, activity. And uh, a redshift, uh, also this a redshift in absorption wavelength. So uh, finally, uh, the modification was made with an enzymatic uh, solution of alcohol dehydrogenase. When the alcohol dehydrogenase encounters the ethanol, there is the, the well-known um, procedure of the uh, NADH formation. So this is uh, our final analyte. So after applying a potential, a potential with the, our potentiosat, we are able to oxidize NADH to NAD+, and our system, to our system, we apply a lead source so that uh, uh, we are able to, uh, to excitate the, the system and generate the electron holes. Uh, and moreover, so the electron goes in the excitation, um, in the excitation level of the cocainons going after to the conductive band of the titanium dioxide system going after to the working electrode where it is um, collected and giving us a signal. So after the optimization of uh, the modifiers parameters, uh, as, as well as the mobilization optimization of the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme, um, we perform ethanol detection uh, in standard solution, giving a, a, a calibration curve here, you can see here with a lot of 0.0, .0 62 uh, molar and a linear range between 0 0.1 molar and one molar. Uh, and finally, ethanol was detected in white uh, wine real samples, obtaining um, a concentration of 1.96 molar. That is, uh, um, uh, um, that is a data very similar to the one where that is labeled on the red wine uh, sample. So finally, I just want to thank you, my research group for the activity uh, and all of you for the kind attention. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. Let's move to the next speaker that is actually Giuseppe Arrabito, but he sent us a 
a, a video because he could not be here today. So now we will start this video. Something like that. That's why I thought you know the link would be too off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I'm I'm having a, a conference oh. you know, to attend, and then uh, you know I don't I cannot have you know an isolated office over there because uh -huh. our office is a Seattle office. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm having it here. Um, uh, Gerald, can you unmute you, please? These uh, printed spots uh, that we obtained by fluorescent microscopy. As you can see, the spots are printed in the form of a micro ray. Uh, the spot size is on the order of 20 to 30 microns in diameter. The spacing is about 50 microns. And they're all printed onto hydrophilic glass surfaces where these phospholipids uh, are able to, to produce some. Sorry, but we are having some problem. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Giuseppe Rabito from the Department of Physics and Chemistry, University of Palermo. The title of the talk I will present you today is uh, Ink Depletion Free Printing of Phospholipid Micro Patches. I'd really like to thank the organization committee for giving me the opportunity to present this talk. And also I would like to apologize for not being able to attend the virtual conference this, this day, uh, but this is due to very important personal reasons. So this talk is uh, definitely in the, uh, with the, uh, within the framework of printing biology, uh, which is uh, a research field at the intersection between the printing methodologies and the synthetic biology. In particular, today we will see the possibility to produce by micro cantilever spotting some phospholipid micro patches. In particular, micro cantilever spotting is a technique which permits to use very tiny amounts of inks on the order, as you can see, of 0 0.2, 0 0.4 microliters. And uh, by, by using a micro, micro cantilever uh, build up micro channel, it's possible to, to produce, to, to print some droplets at the femtoliter scale, which contain, uh, in this case, a mixture of two different phospholipids, which, uh, which are the DOPE, as a, just used as a carrier, and the HPE Fitch, which is uh, uh, characterized by the presence of uh, a fluorophore, the fluorescein in particular that permits, uh, permits at the end to obtain some uh, fluorescence images uh, of these uh, printed spots uh, that we obtain by fluorescent microscopy. As you can see, the spots are printed in the form of a micro ray. Uh, the spot size is on the order of 20 to 30 microns in diameter. The spacing is about 50 microns. And they're all printed onto hydrophilic glass surfaces where these uh, phospholipids are able to, to produce some, we say, solid supported even layers which are, let's say, our model of uh, biological membrane. Uh, in particular, in this work, uh, we have analyzed the, uh, possi the possibility to, to, to use a different kind of ink formulations. In particular, we use the first ink formulation, which is based on ethanol, which is very good for dissolving uh, uh, phospholipids. And as, as you can see, we have changed the concentration of glycerol uh, in order to produce the spots of different sizes and different geometry. 
uh, by maintaining constant the contact time between the, the cantilever and the surface and also the relative humidity. Uh, so in particular, the effect of glycerol, as I said before, is one to, um, let's say, to modulate the size and also the geometry of the spots. In particular, the conservation of the 20% uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, geometry and also in terms of uh, spots, uh, I would say signal homogeneity is the best one. Whereas the one that 10% produce some hollows in the center of the spots, which are due to the, to the capillary, capillary uh, let's say, flows, which um, permit the phospholipid to, to be more, uh, I would say, controlled on, controlled on, on the border, border of, of, the, of the droplet, whereas the very high concentration, we see some hollows uh, at the border of the droplet because uh, this is due to the fact that glycerol tends to occupy uh, uh, some parts of the uh, of, of the spotted droplets so this does not allow the phospholipid to be i would say homogeneously co covering the uh, spotted surface so at the end of, of this first i would say optimization we found out that uh, maybe the 20 percent concentration is the best one but we are not happy, so we try to change the formulation uh, by uh, replacing ethanol with water. Water is much better in terms of the possibility to also uh, produce, to uh, say, uh, to add uh, to the liquid mixture also some other biological molecules, let's say DNA or even better proteins. Uh, but we found out that this, the size of the <clears throat> Of the spotted droplets is uh, definitely larger in comparison to the to the ones we produce with under ethanol, and also the the size depends on the amount of hydrophilicity. So very high hydrophilic, really highly hydrophilic glass surfaces produce some droplets where we see a much higher concentration of the phospholipid at the border of, of the spotted droplets, as you can see in these pictures. Whereas if the glass is uh, mildly hydrophilic, uh, we see some more homogeneous coverage. Uh, Daniele Gulli, who is the co-author of this presentation, also uh, analyzed the uh, three-dimensional structures of these spots and found out uh, that uh, the signal distribution is almost the homogeneously, I would say, uh, present all, all over the spotted uh, system. Uh, but in general, I would say the aqueous based inks are easier to be used for producing make arrays. They, they tend to uh, have a higher, I would say, spreading on the glass surfaces, which is normal. Uh, in this moment, at this moment, we are also trying to understand the, uh, the possibility to use these systems as a model, I would say, model by myometic membranes for understanding the interaction between phospholipids and some uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. Uh, like in particular alpha lactalabumin, which is very important, very used as a model system to this regard. Okay, let's move to the next speaker is Giuliana Siracusa from University of Veruna. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present my PhD project in here, which is about a super silac based mass spectrometry analysis of histone modifications in pidaxel lines. But first of all, what is PIDAC? PIDAC stands for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the fourth leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide. It's usually not diagnosed until the spread beyond the pancreas itself. And this is mainly due to the presence of a small subset of cells called the pancreatic cancer stem cells, which are known to drive tumorogenesis as well as to play a pivotal role in both chemo resistance and disease relapse. It's still unclear which are the epigenetic events that lead the, the differentiation process of cancer cells. Um, therefore, to better understand the pancreatic cancer stem cells biology, we performed an epiproteomic analysis of histone modifications and in particular of acetylation and methylations on two different pancreatic cancer cell lines, which are PANC1 and PACA3. Therefore, we obtain pancreatic cancer stem cells by culturing parental cells into a stem-specific medium up to two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks. From the fourth week's one, we were able to obtain adherent cancer stem cells by reculturing them into the parental cell medium for 10 days and two months. We extracted histones from those samples and we mixed them with an equal amount of a super silac mix. Sorry for the repetition. 
which was obtained by mixing four different breast cancer cell lines and culturing them into a, a specific medium containing and supplemented with uh, heavy labeled amino acids. So uh, this mixture was then um, separated on a 70% SDS page and bands corresponding especially to histone 3 and histone 4 were excised and in gel digested with trypsin. The peptide mixtures obtained was then separated by using a ultra nanoflow HPLC connected online with a QX active mass spectrometer instrument at the uh, Instituto Europeo di Oncologia in Milan with, by our collaborators. And we were able to identify a total of 48 and 55 uh, modified histones, respectively in PANC1 and PACA3 cell line. Then a multivariate analysis was performed and we applied an unsupervised PCA um, in order, on the two mixed data sets in order to uh, have an overview of the general trends of the data set. In this slide, we can see that on PC1, we have a distinct um, a separation between adherent like cells, so adherent and parental cells, and cancer stem cells. On PC2, we can also see and notice um, a difference between cancer stem cells of the two different cell lines, which grouped uh, fairly well together. Uh, then, in order to uh, obtain information about the differences between epithelial-like and more mesenchymal-like cells, we also um, applied a supervised OPLSDA, which allowed us to identify and filter out a total of 22 um, modified histones. And among them, we targeted and we chose these two um, modified histones, um, which were also more abundant in pancreatic cancer stem cells, as compared to the parental counterpart. Um, by searching in literature, we found out that these two histones um, are two well-known oncohistones. In particular, the first one, so the um, lysine 4, um, histone 4 uh, trimethylated on lysine 20, is uh, correlated to a mesenchymal identity, a mesenchymal state. Whereas uh, the other, so uh, histone 3, trimethylated on lysine 9 is correlated to a chemoresistant phenotype of PDAC cells. So um, we expect that um, the study of pancreatic cancer stem cell characteristics, including their epigenetic pattern, will allow the improvement of some therapeutic strategies targeting PDAC cells and uh, um, that usually do not affect the counterpart of pancreatic cancer stem cells. So um, we hope that this will have, at the end of this project, um, this will have an impact in cancer field. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank you, to thank my research group and the all of you for your attention. Thank you, Giuliana. Okay, let's move to the last speaker of this slide and talk session is Hulden Ulukan Karnak. I don't know if the pronunciation is correct from Un Ege University in Turkey. Hulden, are you are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can see you and I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hello everyone, I'm Fuldan from Ege University and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in this university. And first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me here today and also giving me that chance my PhD thesis in such a great organization. So. Uh, our aim to uh, develop a nanomaterial uh, that can recognize mucin one as the uh, biomarker of uh, cancer, and also it can uh, be a, um, it can be used as the metastasis diagnosis and cancer treatment. So we need to uh, we, uh, we aim to develop uh, a nanomaterial for this biomarker and uh, its implementation on a uh, electrochemical biosensor. Uh, First of all, what is Mucin-1? Uh, it's a uh, FDA-approved biomarker for especially uh, breast cancer, but uh, it's normally it's secreted from epithelial cells, uh, apical surface. But when someone's cancer, it can be secreted from uh, all surfaces of the 
cells. So uh, we think that we can use it for the um, clue of the cancer and also metastasis. And also it's, uh, it can be used and it's used as the uh, immunotherapeutic agent and also vaccine for the cancer. So we uh, developed a strategy for uh, creating an anapolymer that can be uh, specific for the Mucin-1 and we use lectin affinity-based techniques. And uh, our nanopolymer is based on a metacrylate-based uh, system and we uh, functionalized and modify it with the um, lectin and also uh, some salinization agents and we characterized our nanopolymer with several uh, advanced techniques and we implemented it onto the uh, biosensor electrode surface as the uh, biological uh, active layer and we uh, measured uh, our uh, solutions on uh, DPV and CV uh, measurements with the potentiostat. Uh, and then we uh, characterize our system and validate our uh, biosensor. These are main results of our study. Uh, we achieved to recognize Mucin-1 uh, with high specificity uh, with the aid of our uh, functionalizing and uh, silenization from, uh, you can see from the uh, table A. And also we uh, use some other biomolecules that can be compete with the Mucin-1 in biological fluids such as MAMNOS, IgG, and uh, other uh, antigens related with the cancer. And we achieve to uh, de uh, determine Mucin-1 with the uh, high selectivity. Also we compare uh, our system with the uh, commercial ELISA kits and our uh, results very uh, consistent and uh, similar with the commercial kits. And we achieved to uh, develop our system with a uh, low LOD and low response time uh, in compare with the ELISA kit. So we can use this system, uh, especially for the determination of the uh, Mucin-1 in biological fluids, but also we can use it uh, for the um, drug release of the uh, Mucin-1 release of the um, some um, treatment strategies because our uh, we know that our system can recognize Mucin-1 with high specificity and selectivity. So maybe you can um, curious about another uh, results of our uh, study. And this is uh, our articles, uh, doing number and links. Maybe you can uh, read it. Thank you. Thank you, Fulden, and thank you to all the speakers of this morning session. And so now we will have uh, a pause for lunch, and then we will start again at 2.30 p.m. So see you this afternoon, and thank you again to all of you for your attention. Goodbye.